The war between the demon lord and humans lasted for many years and took many human lives. The world is mired in chaos, and then the demon lord fell by the hand of Alexandrite, wielding the sacred sword, turfing. The man finished the story by saying that everyone lived happily after that. The child who was sitting on his lap asked his father if it was true that this sword really existed, to which the man replied that who knows. The woman called out the boy's name and said that it was time for him to sleep, while Maine was talking about the holy sword of turfing. The child held a book in his hands and thought with a smile on his face that someday he would have such a sword, and he will go on a real adventure. Five years have passed since then. Maine looked at the large building and joyfully said that it was the capital's temple. The young guy looked ahead with a smile and wondered if he was really here to get his skills. Suddenly he heard the cry of the boy next to him, who asked why he was doing this, because with such skills it would be difficult for him, to which the woman next to him replied that the boy could help her around the house. Skill refers to a kind of talent that a young man can get at the age of 15. A person can get only three such skills. From what he heard, Maine concluded that it seemed that the kid was not very lucky with the skill. Despite the fact that people's skills should be kept secret, many people talk about them for the sake of trust, and some people who work with skills specifically write about them on advertising posters. Even the king has declared his skills. His first skill is two-handed saint sword, and his second is physical strength. Together, these two skills provide the greatest power in the world. Maine, standing on the stairs in front of the entrance, thought that now he is the most ordinary village hunter, but after getting the skills he will surely change his life. Maine climbed the stairs and went to the entrance, where he was stopped by a knight, asking the boy if he had come to receive his skill, to which Maine replied in the affirmative. The knight asked the boy to introduce himself, to which Maine gave his name and said that he turned 15 today. The knight answered the boy in the affirmative and told him to go to the circle. He pointed out that the boy should put his hand to the pearl and be glad that he had become an adult. Maine went towards the ball with a smile, glad that he had become an adult. He stretched out his hand to the pearl in front of him, remembering how five years ago his parents died from an epidemic. Nevertheless the boy was able to survive, and now he is already 15. Maine thought that it was all thanks to the support of everyone in the village and God's grace. The young man, standing in front of the ball and putting his palm on it, sincerely thanked all the people who helped him. Suddenly, a huge force enveloped the young man from all sides, and energy fields appeared nearby. From what was happening, Maine exclaimed in surprise. The knights approached the young man with words of congratulations. They said that the guy had just received his skills. They looked at the ball to report the skill and exclaimed in shock that it was a cut pace skill. The knights exclaimed that this was so unusual, and Maine asked in perplexity. The young man clarified what unusual means. Maine thought about how he often sees the carved skill among the village hunters. It serves to divide the carcasses of captured animals into parts. Maine saw how the insert skill was used in workshops. With it, you can repair any tool by simply connecting the parts together. The knight standing in front of the guy explained that cut and paste are quite popular skills but few people would get both at once. They also noticed the grading. Maximum, the knights had seen this skill for the first time. One of the knights explained that it could be used to find out a person's name, gender, or profession. This skill is also called the Eye of God. It shows complete information about a person, but it depends only on the young man how he will use it. The knights in front of the young man ended up saying that everything is in the hands of the guy, because the skill is life itself. Maine thanked the knights with a smile. The guy left the capital's temple. He was riding in a small cart down the street and thinking that it was half a day's drive from this place to Lucas, when suddenly his thoughts were interrupted by a voice that shouted the guy's name. The man who called out to Maine was riding on the same leash as the young man. The man uttered words about how strange it was, because Maine had arrived in the capital, to which the boy replied in surprise, calling Mr. Edgar by name. They were still riding in the cart, and Mr. Edgar was surprised to talk about how the guy had grown up so quickly. Maine asked the man if the keeper of the Lucas Gate was really resting today. Edgar replied in the negative, saying that he was thinking about it. He said something was wrong. Mr. Edgar frowned and said that the other day he went to the guild of an acquaintance who saw orcs in the Lucas forest. Maine exclaimed in shock that he goes there every day, and orcs are dangerous demons that eat both people and cattle. He said they could eat him like that. Mr. Edgar said that he had always thought that orcs lived far from the Lucas forest. The man told the young man to be careful if he went into the forest. The man yawned widely and, apologizing to Maine, said that he really wanted to sleep, and then asked to wake him up when they arrived. Maine agreed and told the man to rest. The young man looked outside and thought that maybe he should take a nap too, when suddenly he thought of something. 
Bane looked towards the man and thought that he needed to try out his skills. The guy was thinking that the definition, maximum skill can show everything about a person. He was interested in how he worked. Bane sat for a while looking at the man and decided that he would try to evaluate Mr. Edgar. The guy looked at the man carefully and used his skill. The skill sight was directed at the sleeping Edgar, and after that information about a man who was 24 years old was displayed. He is a guard, his name is Edgar Mansell, and his skills are two, Handed sword, saint and politeness. Maine stared in shock in front of him and couldn't believe that this was Edgar's data. He also couldn't believe in his skills. The guy looked at the man and thought that he had amazing skills and nothing was scary with such a guard. He looked at the other passengers and thought that he was working for the others too. Of course, you can't divulge other people's skills, but he only wanted to take a peek. Maine was shocked. He could see the skills of even those people he saw for the first time. He was thinking that this was probably his assessment, maximum skill. The guy looked at himself and realized that he could even evaluate himself, when suddenly his attention was attracted by the person opposite him. The man opposite was a man named Jeskart. He is a thief with the skills of sewing, dagger, sharp, speed, small. Maine was shocked to think that this man was a thief. The guy wondered why the thief was in this wagon, whether he got there by accident or not. The guy looked at Mr. Edgar who was in a deep sleep and thought that the rest of the people were ordinary adventurers, even without companions. Maine followed the road and thought that the rocky road, which would soon end, was a great chance for a thief. The young man thought that he needed to do something, but the eye of God is not an attacking skill. The guy remembered that cutting is a skill that allows you to process corpses, but it's scary for him to test on the living. Maine was sitting and thinking about what to do, when suddenly he came up with something. He looked carefully at the thief's shoes opposite. The guy used the insert skill. He was glad that it worked, and then he thought that now he needed to do the same with the sword. He used the skill again. Maine thought that with the help of his skills, he connected the shoe in the floor, the scabbard and the blade. It was too late to warn the others, so the guy decided that only he knew the truth. The young man thought that a skill is life itself, if combined skills, you can get a lot. Maine became fixated on combining and wondered what would happen if he used cut. Maine applied his skill on the person opposite and after a moment looked at his hand in shock. He was still able to cut out someone else's skill. Maine wondered if he could insert it into himself. He put his hand to his chest and used the insert skill. The guy thought that only three skills could be obtained from God. They could not be changed or increased in number. However, the guy opened his eyes a little and saw that he already had five skills. Maine wondered if this was a good thing because he just took someone else's skills. Suddenly, footsteps and screams were heard from the side. The passengers of the carriage turned around in surprise, and one guy asked what it was. A large number of armed men on horseback were rushing onto the cart. Someone exclaimed that they were robbers. Mr. Edgar had already woken up by this time, and the man opposite the guy laughed. He jumped up from his seat and cursed loudly, and then shouted that if they did not want to die in this place, then they should drop their weapons. He grabbed the hilt of his sword, but immediately stopped. The scabbard and the sword were firmly connected. The man wanted to move away, but his leg was also attached to the floor, which caused him to fall with a crash. The passengers of the carriage looked at the man in surprise, and one of the guys wondered what was wrong with him. The lying thief was asked what he would do now, because without his dagger he was nobody. The man was ordered to be tied up, which caused him to swear loudly. Maine looked out of the wagon at that moment. The young man uttered words about what was catching up with them. He started counting the robbers one by one. It turned out that eight people were following them. The guy shouted that he had to evaluate their skills. Suddenly an arrow flew in their direction. One of the guys managed to grab Maine and pull him aside, so that the arrow did not hit him. The guy shouted a question about what the mine was doing, because he was almost hit. The young man touched the scratch on his cheek and said the words that he got off with a scratch, and then looked in front of him, because he had time to assess the robbers. Maine looked seriously at the information in front of him and thought that he needed to cut out particularly dangerous skills first. The girl who was riding a horse pulled the bowstring and laughingly said the words that she could see everything, so they should be envied. The girl froze for a moment, and then clutched at her eyes, asking what was wrong with them. The man next to her asked what she was doing. This man shouted with a smile that he would smash the cart with his magic. He prepared to attack, but at that moment, Maine used his cut skill, which is why the man could not summon the wind. He exclaimed that his skill was not working, and the man next to him shouted that he had it too, and then asked what was going on. 
At this time, Main stood with a slight frown and wiped his sweat, saying that he had so many skills. The passengers of the carriage, led by Edgar, rushed to attack the discouraged robbers, shouting that it was over. Main was about to run towards them when two men in the cart shouted at him to keep an eye on the man and not get out because it was dangerous there. Suddenly, he heard the thief on the floor wondering why the lives of his comrades should end here, which made the guy freeze. The carriage with passengers arrived in the city of Lucas. Edgar was talking to a man who said they were lucky to have him in the carriage. This man said that he would bring the man a reward, to which he replied that he did not need to, since it was time for him to go to work. He told the man to thank the others. Mr. Edgar noticed something. He said the words that it was something, and then asked Maine if he was okay, to which the guy replied in the affirmative. The guy asked Edgar what would happen to those people, to which the man replied that they would be sent to hard labor in a dungeon, where they would be for the rest of their lives. Maine asked if they would really be like slaves, to which Edgar replied that this was the life they had chosen themselves. Maine was amazed, he said the words about life out loud, and thought that the skill is life itself. The young man remembered the man from the cart, who muttered the words that the lives of his comrades should end here. Maine pursed his lips and wondered if he had cut them off. Mr. Edgar called out to the depressed young man, but he apologized and said that he was tired, so he would go home. The man looked at Maine questioningly and remained in place. The guy walked through the city past the houses until he reached his own. He opened the door and stepped over the threshold. Maine said with a smile that he was at home. He looked around the room and called mom and dad. The guy sat on the edge of the bed and looked at the family portrait. He turned to his father and said that he had gained an incredible skill today. The guy asked if he could use it properly. He wondered how his father would have done it. Maine leaned back and lay down, closing his eyes. He asked the question of what to do now. It was completely dark outside by this time. Morning came. Maine went to the forest. The guy exhaled and said the words that it was a cold morning. He thought it was fresh, though. He needs to train his skills. Maine saw a forest rabbit from behind the bushes. He thought that he usually couldn't catch them, but he got the skill agility from thieves, and he also decided to use speed. The guy got ready and immediately headed towards the rabbit, who was looking at the guy in shock. The young man rushed past the frozen rabbit with a dagger in his hand, knocking out his victim. He thought that skills were very cool. The rabbit was lying on the ground, and Maine exclaimed that it was easy, and now that the rabbit was caught, he used the cut skill. Now he has delicious meat and a fluffy skin. The guy joyfully clenched his fists and said that he could use these skills to good use as someone appeared behind him. Maine quickly hid behind a tree and looked back. There was an orc nearby and the guy said that means they really are found here. The young man thought that killing orcs was a task for real adventurers but not for people like him. He suddenly stopped and thought that he had changed. Maine looked at the orc to check the information. He was interested in the word above the skill killer's hand, skills. He was surprised that he could even watch this. Apparently, this is a replacement for human skills. The guy stretched out his hand, saying to cut out two skills and paste them for himself, but nothing happened. It turns out that skills cannot be cut out. However, the guy could definitely take the killer's hand. Now the poor orc is left without skills. Nain thought he could do it. He used speed small and rushed towards the orc. The monster turned towards the guy, who was surprised by its size. Maine thought he had hit it. However, the guy was already heading towards the orc, so gritting his teeth, he used the wind skill. The blow fell on the orc, and the guy thought that he had blown off half of his head. Would he be able to do this with the body? He decided it could wait. Maine swung his blade and used the assassin's hand, again delivering a powerful blow to the orc. Maine landed and exclaimed with joy because he had defeated the monster. He remembered to use the clipping. The guy said that if the orc is alive, but you can say goodbye to him. He used the cut skill. Maine got a big piece of meat. He was glad of the big carcass. This meant that the young man had defeated the orc. Maine said that with the cut and paste skills, he can do anything. At this time, the knight came to the man and informed him about the report, to which he asked what happened, because the knight does not often just come in like that. The knight said that a young man with an unusual skill had recently been spotted. The man curiously hurried the knight, to which he replied that this was an assessment, maximum. The man was surprised and asked if it was really the eye of God. He thought it was a man with such a rare skill, and then asked the knight if he found it interesting. Maine, after having lunch, went to the city to sell the defeated orc. The guy came to some store to a man who looked in surprise at the goods brought by the young man. There was a large pile of meat in front of him, to which the man asked if the guy had brought something useful. He couldn't believe it was an orc and Maine awkwardly asked what the man would take him for. The man thought about it and replied that they usually pay one silver coin per kilogram. However, he said that today was a special day, 
and he was very glad that the guy had grown up, for which the guy thanked his grandfather. The old man replied that instead of one silver coin, he would give the guy 23 gold pieces. Maine was shocked to ask why there was so much and if it was normal. The guy, leaving the shop, told the old man that he would bring meat back later, which made the old man think he would go bankrupt. Maine came to another shop, greeting Mr. Renquinha. The man recognized the guy and told him to come. Maine explained that he had killed an orc while hunting, so he came to the village to sell it. The man asked in confusion if he had misheard, and then, seeing the contents of the guy's bag, exclaimed in shock that these were orc lenses. He grabbed the goods and began to examine them, asking if they were magic stones of the orcs. The man exclaimed that the guy had no idea how important it was. Mr. Ranquina grabbed another object and asked if it was an orc testicle. It was also a useful thing. He offered the guy one gold coin and 32 silver pieces, to which Maine replied that he was rich. The man said that orc bones were also expensive, so he asked where they were. Maine awkwardly replied that 50 kilograms of bones would not fit in his bag, so he threw them away. Mr. Ranquina asked Maine if he was in a hurry, and then shouted towards the door for a bag to be brought to him. A quick reply was heard from there. A girl came out to them with a bag in her hands and wondered if he would like it. She called the guy Little Maine, greeting him at the store. The guy was slightly embarrassed and wondered if this was Ranquigny's wife. The man said that in this bag you can safely carry up to 10 tons of stuff, and he gives it to Maine. The guy replied in surprise that it was cool, and the man continued, saying that he wanted Maine to listen to something. Mr. Ranquina said he wanted the guy to kill three orcs. He does not specify any time limits. They were in shock. The girl asked the man what he was doing. Did he really want the baby Mina to be eaten? She exclaimed the words that the orc boys would torture him, and the girls would shorten him, and their mind was still small for such a thing. Mr. Ranquina shouted at her to stop. The girl was told that the young man was able to defeat the orc, she was surprised. The man replied that he did not believe it himself at first, and then asked Maine if he really got great skills while the girl was worried about the young man. Maine asked why they were so worried about him, even if he was only capable of killing orcs. The man explained that in fact, the resources of the orcs are in great demand, and are very expensive to sell. If you ask some adventurer to kill an orc, you can lose a lot of money. Maine replied that he understood. He took the gift in his hands and said that with such a beautiful bag, he would definitely bring three orcs to the man. Mr. Ranquina told the guy not to overdo it, because in order to read harder, only one life is given. Maine agreed and wished them luck. The man looked at the table and said the words that it was a potion. The guy took two of them. Maine went on, and the girl shouted at him to come back alive, for which the guy thanked her. The guy went to the forest. As he walked, he talked to himself about being told not to overdo it, but with such a good bag, he wanted to meet expectations. Maine was walking through the forest and thinking that somewhere nearby he had thrown away the bones of an orc, when suddenly he saw something. There was a forest sheep in front of him. He was walking so fast that he didn't even notice it. The young man hid behind a tree and thought that her wool was probably expensive. Maine looked at the forest sheep using the skill evaluation, maximum. He saw auxiliary magic, sleep and alchemy, so he decided that he had to get both skills. He leaned his free hand against a tree and thought that the hunt would be good, when suddenly he noticed a tree. He exclaimed questioningly and pulled his hand, which is sticking to the tree. At the same moment, the forest sheep noticed him and quickly ran away. Mine quickly used the cut skill to free himself and cursed. The guy looked up and saw a huge caterpillar web that surrounded him from all sides. Maine saw a caterpillar sitting on a spider web and eating bones, which made him angry. He thought that this was her nest. The guy decided that he would get rid of her. Maine used the speed, small and strength skills. Jumping through trees, he headed straight for the caterpillar, shouting the words that it was over. However, before he could reach her, he collapsed to the ground. He couldn't understand why his body was so heavy. At that moment, the caterpillar swung and hit right on the ground where the guy was, causing him to fly away screaming. Maine flew into a tree and coughed, trying to figure out what it was. He quickly used the grating skill on the caterpillar and saw the auxiliary magic, low-speed skill, which surprised him. The wounded guy, sitting under a tree, quickly used the cut skill, his head was bursting at the seams. Suddenly, a huge foot appeared next to him. The guy was shocked because several orcs appeared in front of him. He thought it was very timely. Maine noticed that there were just three of them. He carefully looked through the information about them. The orcs had no skills, no skills, they were just weaklings. The young man exclaimed the words that he needed to prepare, so he quickly used low speed, thereby slowing down the orcs. He was glad it was working. The guy thought he needed the power to help him deal with three orcs. Maine suddenly remembered that he also has auxiliary magic, sleep. 
He immediately used this skill, after which two orcs fell to the ground, but the situation is still not the best. Main got ready and began to use the skills one after another improving vision. Medium, prayer, strong, strength, acceleration, strengthening legs, small. He clearly decided that after that he would definitely deal with the monsters. The young man rushed to the attack. After a quick strike, one monster was defeated. Main immediately used wind magic, defeating the second orc, and then struck at the sleeping orc, defeating him as well. The guy defeated all the orcs. Immediately he was pierced by pain, but he had to go for the bones. The guy suddenly remembered the potion that Mr. Ranquina had given him. He took it out and used it, and indeed, the pain was gone. Main wondered if Mr. Ranquina had created a recovery potion, because it was a useful item. The guy said the words that alchemy is a skill that he received from a sheep. Main looked at the information about himself and noticed that his skills were not listed in full, but turned into and so on. The young man looked at the long list and thought that it would be hard for him with so many skills. Main looked at the information about himself and thought that he should not tell other people about his skills because he stole them. He didn't want to rob people's lives anymore. The guy looked up and decided that he needed to learn to live on his own, and this would be his first adventure. Main is back in the capital, in the city of Augustine. Even though it was his second time in the capital, the guy was amazed at how many people there were. When Main was here for the first time, he only went to the main temple. There the young man got his eye of God and cut, paste. With these skills, the guy's life became much easier, and when he began to combine them, he got irreversible consequences. The guy stole someone else's skills. Main didn't even think about ruining other people's lives. He didn't want to do anything wrong. The guy was even ready to swear. Suddenly, the young man turned his attention to the adventurer's guild. Vane came to the door and apologized uncertainly, walking inside and looking around. That's how he got into the adventurer's guild. Vane looked ahead with admiration and wondered if all these people were adventurers. He said that everyone is so strong. The guy even recognized those who were with him in the cart. The guy wanted to see at least one familiar face while people around him were talking about different things to do or that Lucas had orcs. Main saw a large counter in front of him and suggested that maybe he could fit into the guild there. The young man approached one of the girls and, introducing himself, said that he wanted to become an adventurer. And then he asked if it was possible to sign up here, to which the girl looked at him in disbelief. All the people in the guild immediately noticed them and started talking about the guy approaching Asia. Someone was wondering what kind of child he was and what he was doing at all. One of the guys turned to the other, calling him Ryle, so that he would look at the kid, to which he replied that Aisha did not communicate with such people. Main awkwardly apologized and said the words that it looks like adventurers are not becoming here. The poster awkwardly shouted at the guy to wait. She said that everything was fine. The guy apologized again, and then asked if she had seen the faces of those guys, to which she replied in the affirmative. Aisha explained that many adventurers say all sorts of nonsense. They were just surprised by the politeness of the guy. To this, Main replied that he could see while others were looking at him with a threat. The girl told Main to just sit here, she would register him, and then explain everything to the adventurers. The guy agreed. When the guy was about to sit down, a huge guy came up to him from behind and asked him to wait. He told Main to prove that he was an adventurer. Aisha shouted at Held that she would not forgive him for this, to which he replied that he would just show the guy the reality. Held grabbed Main by the collar and said that the guy had to be an experienced killer to be in this place, to which the guy replied that he had never heard of such a thing. Held tightened his grip on the young man and lifted him off the ground, asking what he had just said, cursing along the way. Aisha screamed for Held to stop, when suddenly a man came out of one of the rooms and asked what the fuss was on the ground floor. At that moment, Held was holding the young man by the collar, and the man asked if the guy was fooling around again. Held let go of Main, throwing him back on the floor. He said with a smile that the guy was too weak. Main frowned and looked at Held, thinking that he had to do something. However, he froze, looking at the guy in front of him, who asked with a grin that the guy was really resisting. Held quickly and powerfully swung his arm to strike, shouting about how he was sick of everything. Main thought it was painful, so something had to be done. Suddenly, Aisha appeared behind the young man, who shouted the guy's name, grabbing him from behind. Main looked at her in shock and wondered why she was doing this. Main turned at the flying fist of Held and thought about Aisha. The young man, using the skill of strength, thought that it was not very fair. The guy noticed that the young man had done something. However, he hit Main right in the body, which threw the guy away and he coughed. The man watching the scene was shocked, as the guy was able to protect Aisha. Main was lying on the floor, and Aisha was standing next to him and shouting his name. The young man really tried. Aisha continued to call Main and Held pointed at him and said that this is what losers look like. 
The man came out and asked the adventurer what was going on here. Held turned around and asked who dared to interrupt him, and then immediately tensed up. The adventurer saw a man behind him who looked at him seriously, and then asked if he could be more polite. Held hesitated at this. The man said he needed an explanation. Held replied that this recruit had asked him, as an older comrade, to train him. Aisha shouted the words that it was a lie. She wanted to explain everything, but the knight next to her said that they would talk to her later, so the girl fell silent. The man frowned and looked at the other adventurers, who were immediately confused. The man said he wanted to hear from witnesses. He asked if Held's words were true, ordering them to answer. The guy replied that Held had hit a defenseless guy and the girl next to him added that they did not have time to intervene, and apologized. Held shouted in their direction that they would not get away with it. The man turned to Aisha and asked her to explain to him what it was like to be a member of the guild. The girl replied that if you violated the laws of the state, their guild is a trusted organization. They are equal before the law, so as a fine they will ask for 10 platinum coins from a person and can be expelled. The man looked at Mayan and said that the young man should not worry, Everything will be fine, because he protected the girl. He thought they could use people like that. Aisha called the guys and asked them to take the young man to the medical room. The girl who came up quickly accepted the request. Aisha got up and hurried them on. The man turned to Held, saying that he had only two options, pay 10 platinum coins, or the man would cut off his hand right now. He told the adventurer to choose. Held was a little confused, and then he swung and shouted that none of this was happening. The man accepted the answer, and Held said that he had done nothing wrong. He grabbed his weapon and shouted, attacking the man, that he was not guilty of anything. The adventurers around were shocked. They thought that Held had gone crazy, so they decided it was time to run away. At this time, Held was furious, and the adventurers stopped. The man asked what Held was talking about. The adventurer was standing without hands, and the man asked who would pay for the repairs then. Held was shocked. The man turned around and said that because of the guy, his entire beautiful parquet was ruined. He hoped that there would be those who would help him with the repairs. Held is a class D adventurer. He's pretty strong. However, he lacks self-control. The man thought about Maine, who was lying unconscious. He decided that the guy was not a bad guy. Maine opened his eyes slightly and mumbled something. He looked at the ceiling and asked where he was. Aisha appeared in front of his eyes and asked if the guy had woken up. The young man recognized the girl. He jumped up and called her and asked if she was okay and if she was hurt. Aisha asked in surprise if he was talking about her. Suddenly, the guy's body was pierced by pain. He said that something was wrong with his body. The girl replied that he needed to rest, and the guy asked what was wrong with him and why he had wounds. The man appeared on the doorstep and replied that the guy had almost died. He said it was very difficult to protect someone from the blows of the held. Aisha saw the man and called out, calling him the head of the guild, which surprised the young man. The man explained that this time he was saved by Aisha's magic, but if he wants to become an adventurer in the future, then he should be more careful. The head asked if the guy still wanted to be an adventurer. Main replied that of course it was a big risk. The young man thought that his parents wanted him to become one, and everyone in the village also wanted this. Also, the guy got his skills for a reason. Main confidently replied that he wanted to for everyone's sake. He always dreamed of becoming an adventurer. He thought he would be just like the hero Alexandrite. The girl turned to the head and asked him to give Lane his card. The guy asked about the map in confusion. The man picked up the card and threw it towards the young man, who was very surprised. He explained that it was a guild card identity card that needed to be shown in order to receive awards. It was indicated on the map that Aisha is an escort. The head replied that he had decided to give Maine a personal escort as an apology for help. He also thought that Aisha was perfect for him. Maine looked at Aisha, processing the information. The girl smiled and said that they would work together. The man told her to give the young man a job when he wanted, to support him when he needed it, to feed him when he asked, to fulfill all his wishes. The girl awkwardly shouted that the head was incorrigible. The man said that Aisha is the best escort in the guild, so everyone will envy him. The girl smiled and said that Maine was lucky. She was thinking that newcomers rarely come in lately, so at least there will be someone new. Maine joined the guild and became an adventurer, but now he is injured and asks Ryle to stop. The guy shouted that if you don't help a man on earth, he will die, and he's Ryle's friend. The guy in front of the lane replied that it was the young man's fault, and that it was all because of him. Ryle said his enemy was right in front of him and he would kill him. A little earlier, it hasn't been that long since Maine joined the guild. 
Other adventurers discussed that Maine is now an F-class adventurer. The young man turned to Aisha and asked how he could raise this class. The girl replied that you need to complete tasks and get guild points. Maine looked at her and asked if there were any assignments for the F-class. If there is, then he would like to fulfill them as soon as possible. Aisha replied that she would look at it now, and then added that wealth and fame also grow with the level. The guy looked at the ID and said that his parents were no longer alive, but for the sake of the villagers who always believed in him, he would try his best. Aisha was surprised at first, and then she got into it. The girl suddenly lowered her head and asked Maine for forgiveness, which greatly surprised the young man in front of her. Aisha said she didn't know about the guy's parents. She tried to explain herself, but the guy replied that everything was fine and he understood. Maine replied that he was sure that his parents would continue to believe in him, and this gives him confidence. The girl looked at the guy, saying his name. Aisha called out to Maine and said she also believed in him. She said that the guy should never give up, for which the young man thanked the girl. Aisha informed the adventurer that only three tasks were available to him. Maine asked again, and the girl replied that the main one was Slime's murder. Aisha said that Luna Hun was attacked by bandits last month, they stole slug oil, and started a fire. Slug oil is the fuel for fireplaces, llama, and there is still no light in Lunahun. Maine quickly asked if the townspeople were hurt, to which Aisha smiled and replied that their guild members had helped and no one was injured. The guy exhaled and replied that it was wonderful. Aisha went on to explain that the reward for killing a slug is small, but you can get quite a lot of guild points for its oil. The girl said that it was necessary to complete this task for the residents of Lunahun. Maine saw that the other two tasks were goblin killing and delivery. Aisha asked the guy if he knew the slug's habitat. She said that there is a lime pond in the north of the Lukaski forest. Liqueur made from fruits growing on trees near the shore is the specialty of the village, and Goblin loves these lime fruits very much. She said that goblins sometimes go there. Aisha also added that medicinal herbs grow under lime trees. Maine concluded that all three tasks are in one place. He was very lucky. The guy told Aisha that in that case he would take everything at once. The girl replied that she hoped it would not be so difficult to collect herbs, which the guy agreed with. Another girl from the guild turned to Aisha and said that Maine is a good guy. Aisha agreed, and then drooped, thinking about the guy's parents and what she had said. Suddenly, the girl was called by Ryle who asked why Aisha was being nice to this little guy, to which Aisha replied that Ryle should show respect and treat him properly. The guy slapped the counter and asked for what reason, because he is an adventurer in the class. The guy asked what Held had done to deserve this. Ryle frowned and shouted that he was always trying so hard for a girl. Other adventurers noticed this and said that the guy had overdone it, Aisha hadn't done anything. The girl apologized. Aisha confusedly explained to the guy that she saw something in the mind that other people don't have, and then asked if he understood. The guy was furious. Ryle kicked the table nearby with all his might and cursed. Aisha stood in shock, and the people at the table began to swear because the guy spilled their drinks. Ryle said he must have wasted his life. He told Aisha that he didn't understand anything. The guy was angry. He decided to get rid of the young man. Nain was talking to a man at the time, who asked if the young man liked it. The guy, holding a weapon in his hands, asked if it was a special dagger. He was interested in the number after the man's name. The man replied that it was a sword that expressed the light of a blacksmith. The guy clarified what this meant, to which he was told that sometimes when a blacksmith forges armor, this light appears, a sign of great weapon power. The man said that there was a lot of glow from this sword. Main replied that he would buy it, and the man asked if it was too good for simple hunting. He asked if he could also buy black wolf skin. Maine replied that it was time to go after the slug and the goblin. The man was surprised, and the guy told him not to worry, because the young man would cope, since he had already defeated four orcs. He thanked the man and left. The man was surprised. He said that Rankwigny's stories were true. He couldn't believe in the four orcs and hoped that everything would be fine. Maine went to the forest and was almost there. He was walking along the path and remembered how he was here with his parents. The guy went on. She saw a lime pond, which was very beautiful. Maine looked around, there were lime trees not far from the pond. Aisha said that medicinal herbs grow right under them. The young man tore out some herbs to take for himself, as various decoctions are prepared from them. Maine found a nice place with grass while someone was watching him. The young man noticed something and looked around. He thought that someone was there, so he used vision enhancement, medium. Maine saw a large number of monsters around, they were goblins and slugs. He asked why now. At that moment, the slugs rushed to attack, and the guy realized that the goblins were controlling them. Maine quickly began to deal with the slugs, heading towards the goblins. He used speed, but at that moment the goblins disappeared somewhere. The guy looked around, when suddenly they appeared out of the ground. 
The young man quickly jumped back and looked at the goblins again. The monsters disappeared again, and then attacked from above, taking the guy by surprise. One goblin hit the guy on the head. Main thought that these guys were pretty strong, but he was already tired of them. The young man quickly defeated one. While he was being attacked, he was thinking that maybe they had a speed skill. Main used the cut skill. The inscription is gone, but where is it? The guy saw another goblin ordering something to the slugs. He was trying to figure out how he was commanding them. The guy saw that there were slug capabilities next to the slug, but he didn't know what it was. He also saw the goblin's skills. It was an outrageous skill. He decided that he needed to take away the goblin's taming. He used the skill and the slugs began to part. The guy suddenly came up with something. Nain stretched out his hand and used taming. All the slugs suddenly froze and looked at the guy who was still using taming. Nain looked at the frozen slugs and assumed that they were now on his side. He said he had the advantage in numbers. After that, the guy gave an order for the slugs to attack, and everyone immediately rushed forward. A bunch of slugs surrounded the confused goblins, and the guy quickly began to deal with everyone. He hoped they had lost their skills. After a while, all the goblins were defeated. Main didn't know that it turns out demons can be made friends. The guy turned to the slugs and thanked them, saying that he couldn't have done it without them. He needed slug oil, but killing them was kind of sad. Suddenly, all the slugs melted away, leaving only oil behind. The guy assumed that he would no longer be able to use taming. He collected all the oil and said that was it. Main leaned against the slug butter cube and apologized, and then thanked them all. The guy returned to the city where it was already getting dark. He needed to take the loot to Asia as soon as possible. The young man was wondering if there was anyone else there. Main was about to enter the guild when someone called out to him, and the guy thought about what he wanted from him. Ryle stood in front of the mine with a few adventurers behind him. He told the young man that he had a conversation, so the guy needed to approach him. Main was wondering why the guys had called him. He looked around and asked what kind of alley it was, to which Ryle promised that they would finish quickly. One of the adventurers shouted to Ryle that they had not agreed on this. He said that they had been notified that they could be kicked out of the guild for such a thing. Another adventurer added, telling Ryle not to be stupid, because no matter how you look at it, it's murder. He asked if the guy really wanted to make them criminals. Suddenly, a strange fist appeared in front of this adventurer's face. Ryle threatened Ammon to shut up, as they might get rid of him too. Ammon said he wasn't joking, and then asked Ryle if he was crazy. Main wondered what the guy was doing, and what kind of light it was. The adventurers shouted at Ryle to stop. Main immediately used evaluation. The young adventurer realized that the guy had pointed a gun at his friend. Main asked Ryle to stop, because the guy would do whatever they said. The guy, hearing these words, grinned, and the other guys shouted for Main to run, because Ryle would just finish him off. Ammon shouted at Main to get out of there, when he suddenly received a blow from Ryle. The guy told the wounded man not to interfere, and then asked what the others were waiting for. Main rushed towards the adventurer, shouting for him to stop, attacking along the way. Ryle was surprised by the magic of the wind, and the young man thought that even if he missed, it would delay Ryle, who did not see anything. Main ran up to Ammon and asked if he was okay, saying he would give him a healing potion now. The guy took out a potion, but at that moment a container with a potion broke in his hand, and a through hole appeared in his hand. Ryle was standing nearby, asking the guy if he really decided to blind him. Main looked at his hand and thought how much it hurt. He hurried to use the regeneration skill he had. At that moment, Ryle attacked Ammon, who had a hole in his stomach. Main ran towards the adventurer, shouting his name, but another attack was reflected in front of his feet. Ryle asked if the guy had forgotten that he was going to be killed. Main wondered why the guy was attacking. Because he was blinded, he couldn't dodge. Ryle was standing in front of the guy in perfect order, ready to attack. He said the guy didn't even know what kind of experience he had, so he couldn't be outsmarted that easily. The adventurers quickly began to run away, shouting that it was time for them to leave this place. They told Ryle they would report him to the boss. Ryle called them traitors and said he would kill them. However, he was now looking directly at Main, who was covering them with his body. The young man asked Ryle to stop, because if he did not help Mr. Ammon, he would die, and he was his comrade. Ryle frowned and replied that he would kill Ammon along with the guy, but he would take care of the mine first, because if he did not do this, the traitors would run after the head in vain. Main stood and thought that really helping people is not the main task of adventurers, so why does the guy want to take their lives? He thought that if all adventurers were like that, then he felt sorry for them. The young adventurer thought of Alexandrite, who came with a holy sword in his hands, an adventurer knight who protected them all. 
Ryle prepared to attack the guy and asked if he had already accepted death. Lane was thinking about saving lives if his skills could help people. Ryle was confused while Mayan was standing in thought, because his hand bullet skill doesn't work. He grabbed his hand to check. Ryle had his skills now. He thought that now his skills would not harm people. Looking at his palm with Ryle's skills, Mayan turned to Ryle and told him to just calm down. He said he didn't need to hurt anyone anymore. Ryle was confused at first, and then swore at the guy and asked what he had done to him. The adventurer rushed to the guy, asking what he had done to him. He swung to strike, and at that moment Main used the skill of erasing presence, which surprised the guy. Ryle stopped and looked around, shouting that the guy had disappeared. He was asking where the guy had gone. He didn't see him. Suddenly, he noticed that Main was sitting next to Ammon nearby and asked if he was alright. Ammon thanked the guy for helping him. Ryle furiously asked when the guy had managed to pull it off, and Main got to his feet. Ammon asked the young man to leave, to which he replied that everything was fine. Main looked at the guy on the ground and asked him to leave. Ammon looked at the young man in shock and, apologizing, began to leave the alley while Ryle shouted after him, asking where he went. Out of habit, Ryle tried to use the skill, but it didn't work, and he clicked. Main suddenly appeared behind him, who addressed him with the words that it was time to finish. The young man told Ryle that he needed to know the value of other people's lives. Ryle turned around, trying to hit Main, but he disappeared again, which caused the guy to swear. He started waving his fists in different directions, asking where Main Ryle was, shouting for the guy to show up, asking what kind of adventurer he was then. Ryle said irritably that the guy was making him wait. He suddenly swung in front of him, noticing the mine, but again missed. He wondered if he couldn't kill him, because he was an adventurer from the class. Suddenly, Aisha appeared in the alley, calling for Main and the head of the guild, who asked if the young man was safe. Ryle looked at Aisha and the guild head in confusion. He couldn't believe that those guys had actually followed them. Ryle lowered his head and replied to Main that he knew the value of life because his life had always been dedicated to Aisha. However, she never understood this. Ryle suddenly became more serious. He said that he would get his life, his skills, and Aisha too. His words surprised the young man. Ryle grabbed a small blade and rushed towards the approaching girl, shouting that he would get and also kill the girl. Main tried to stop the guy. He used the insert skill on Rail, but he continued to run. The young man couldn't understand why he couldn't do it. He shouted for Ryle to stop, but he was about to stab the girl, who was looking at the blade in confusion, and the head only managed to call out to the girl. Suddenly, Main appeared in front of Aisha. He deflected Ryle's attack, causing his blade to fly off to the side, and the guy himself could not understand what it was. Main swung to attack using the melee, maximum and body enhancement skills. The young man struck a powerful blow directly at Ryle, causing him to fly back. Main was breathing heavily, and the head of the guild was looking at him seriously. Aisha grabbed the guy's hand and asked what was wrong with her. The guy vaguely tried to answer something, and the girl told him to wait a little as she would cure everything now. The girl looked at Main carefully and asked how he was, apologizing. The guy replied that he was feeling better and then thanked him for his help. At that moment, the head of the guild spoke up, who said that he was going to help them anyway, but they did it anyway. The man said that unfortunately, fighting is prohibited in their guild. He added that since the members of Ryle's group told him everything, the man forgives Ryle this time. The head of the guild added that he had one question. He talked about the legs that covered such a distance in an instant, about the power that defeated Ryle and martial arts. The man said that this was an order from the head of the guild. He demanded an explanation from Main as to how he got these powers. The girl in armor came up to her father and asked if it was true that that guy had killed four. The man confirmed his daughter's words, and the knight next to her added that the guy has incredible assessment, maximum and cut, paste skills. Rumors about the power of the mind spread around the world. The girl could not believe in the strength of the guy. The man asked why not discuss with the officer the young man who owns the Eye of God. He wanted to see this guy face to face. The girl asked her father why he needed this, and why he didn't entrust it to her, since she could find the guy herself. The man agreed, saying it was worth a try. At the Adventurer's Guild, the guys asked the head if everything went well and if the mine was safe. The man noticed the girl's gaze on him and asked why she was looking so plaintively. She replied that she was offended, did the man not see this? The girl assumed that Aisha was probably angry too. The girl began to talk about how Main was able to defeat Ryle, the strongest in the C-Class. He could be useful to them. She said that the mine is very dear to Aisha. He even managed to overwhelm the orcs, and also that the head should be afraid of him. The girl called the man reckless, and then asked him to get off the table. Aisha called him a real fool. The girl exclaimed that this was an empty conversation, 
because the mine had already been eliminated, they should just forget it. Aisha saw the man who came. The girl in the cape came up and told Aisha that she would like to ask about the guy who was expelled today. Aisha apologized and replied that they should not tell anything to outsiders. Aisha took a closer look at the girl when she suddenly recognized the princess Sylph. She asked her why she had come, to which the princess asked the girl to be quiet, because someone might hear. Aisha said that a little earlier in that alley, Ryle was punished, and Maine was given 16 gold coins. The young man himself apologized to the head, as he did not tell anything. The head of the guild asked if this guy had violated his orders. Aisha then shouted to the head that revealing their skills is a personal matter for everyone. She asked if the man was crazy, to which he replied his orders to the guild were the law. The man said that he usually does not give such orders. However, he listed the young man's skills, of which there were far more than three, then caught the guy off guard. The head also added that when the guy protected Aisha from Ryle, he did something. The man said that they only get three skills from God, and then asked if Maine wanted to tell him something. The guy apologized to the head and replied that he had nothing to say to the man. The head said that if that was the case, then the guy could no longer be in their guild. Maine accepted this outcome, which is why Ayla exclaimed that he should not leave. She asked how the guy would be alone. Maine was silent for a while, and then thanked the girl with a smile and said that he could handle it alone. The princess said that it was stupid, and then asked the head if there were many adventurers who stuck to the mine, to which the man replied in the affirmative. The princess turned around and asked where they got so much slug oil from. Aisha replied that not far from Luna Hun. Mine got it for them, it was his first assignment. The princess took the cube and said it was amazing and she couldn't believe her eyes. The sylph told Mr. Bazam to look up, because the main thing is that they helped the princess a lot. Sylph was wondering where the guy was now. She needed to find out somehow. The princess asked Aisha if she knew where Maine lived, because she urgently needed to meet him. The head of the database said that he could deliver the girl to Lucas as a gift. However, Aisha said that it was not worth it. It was better for a man to look after the guild, because it should serve the state faithfully. Aisha asked the princess to go with her. She wanted to see the guy again to apologize. The sylph replied to Aisha that of course she could go. The princess said that they could go together, because Aisha is pretty strong, so she can serve as reliable protection and help. Aisha thanked the princess. They went to the town of Lucas, where they met Mr. Edgar. The man, seeing Aisha, asked if they needed help, to which the girl replied that everything was fine. They just decided to visit Maine. Edgar replied that the guy had gone into the woods a long time ago, worried about something. The young man said that the village hunters had seen orcs in the forest, and went there alone. Edgar said he would go with him, but who would replace him at work? It was an awkward situation. Aisha said they were going to the forest to find out what was going on there. Edgar asked who the man with Aisha was, since he couldn't let the illegals through. The sylph took off her hood and asked if she could still show her a pass, to which the man exclaimed that there were no questions. Edgar bowed to the princess and repeated that there were orcs in the forest. He offered to escort the princess. The girl replied that it was not necessary. Aisha said that, as a last resort, she would be able to protect the princess, so it was better for the man to stay. The sylph said that Edgar would be much more useful to the townspeople, because the orcs could attack the city directly. She added that their city needs brave defenders like him, so she is sure that he will serve the motherland well. The princess said that this city is under the protection of Edgar Marcel. The man bowed and asked the girls to help this kid. The princess gave her word, and then they set off. Maine ran through the forest, using skills and fighting orcs. He killed five, but he heard the others nearby. Maine heard a sound. The guy walked around the tree and saw a bound girl who was unconscious. Maine found the village of the orcs. There were a lot of human bones underfoot. The guy was wondering how many people died here. Maine saw that the girl had been caught by the orcs. She needed urgent help. However, his opponent is not an easy one. And although Maine has gained so many skills for himself, he did not know if he would be able to cope this time. Suddenly, the orc tried to grab the girl but only tore her clothes, causing her to scream. Maine noticed this and immediately rushed to the attack, tearing off the orc's arm. He thought that it didn't matter anymore, he just had to cope. He stood among the orcs and shouted that he would deal with them right here with his own hands. There were six strong orcs in front of Maine. He needed to attack them to save the girl. The demon tried to strike at the guy, but he screamed and twisted. The orc struck again, but Maine jumped over his arm, causing him to hit another orc. The guy thought he needed to use something. He used the insert and put to sleep skill, which caused the orc in front of him to instantly fall asleep. These were quite effective skills. Maine began to attack the other orcs in turn, and after a while the monsters were defeated by a guy who suddenly noticed something. 
he was trying to figure out what was going on. His strength began to grow, as did his level. Main was surprised, as his level suddenly rose from the 13th to the 20th. Main started towards the girl, but suddenly a stream of power hit him. It was wind magic, and the guy's whole body began to drift away. He immediately used resistance and magic, regeneration. Main saw a bunch of orcs and couldn't figure out where so many of them came from, and his strength was almost running out. Suddenly, a huge monster appeared in front of the guy, it was an orc general. The young man began to regret that he had ventured into the forest alone. In front of him stood the general of the orcs, the king of the orcs, the servants of the king. The whole kingdom was assembled. The guy was wondering where the general of the orcs came from in this forest. Princess Sylphida and Aisha were walking through the forest and noticed a strange wind. Aisha informed the princess that Maine had already met orcs in this forest. The sylph heard that the guy killed four people. The sylph immediately realized that the orcs were heading for the capital. She asked Aisha why she didn't tell the princess about it right away. Suddenly, the girls heard a strong noise from the forest. They tried to figure out where the sound was coming from. Aisha rushed to run, shouting the name of Maine. The princess ran after the girl. Part of the forest was on fire, and in the center lay the guy who was attacked. He had not expected fire magic at all. He urgently needed to recover. The guy got to his feet and noticed that it seemed that the orcs of the highest class were protecting the general. He finally found the right moment, but he was immediately attacked, causing the guy to fly back. He thought that this was the end. At that moment, Main heard his name being called and asked to hold on. He opened his eyes a little. The girl called out to the guy and shouted for him to turn around. The guy turned around and saw an orc rushing at the guy. He had almost no strength, when suddenly a princess appeared, who defeated the orc with a light blow of her sword. Suddenly, an orc general appeared. The princess shouted to Aisha that there were three of them here. The orc general was preparing to attack the humans, so the sylph ordered the guys not to approach so that she could deal with them herself. Suddenly, the orc's attack stopped, which made the princess confused, and the guy, getting up, said that he was already fine. Suddenly they heard someone talking about how delicious people are. They were trying to figure out where the voice was coming from, and who was saying it. It turned out that the orcs decide who to eat first. Suddenly, a huge orc appeared in front of the guys. Maine didn't even understand where it came from. It was the great lord of the orcs. Maine stared at him, not understanding anything. After all, the king himself was standing in front of them. The young man stood in front of the orc king and tried to figure out how he got here. The guy saw the monster swing to attack, so he quickly grabbed the girls, shouting for them to take care. They barely had time to run away when the king hit the ground. The girls screamed. Maine was thrown to the side and coughed. They were thrown so hard, even though they were not hit. The guy was shocked by the terrifying power. Maine thought that as long as the king was so strong, fighting with him was comparable to self-sacrifice. But if he stripped the orc of its skills and weakened it, he could win. Suddenly, the orc king disappeared, and a moment later the girls screamed, which made Maine turn around. The girls were captured by the orcs, and the guy, calling out to them, tried to figure out where the king was, in front or behind. The king appeared in front of the guy and attacked, causing him to fly back. The girls screamed his name because the orcs began to lick them, and asked them to save them. Suddenly, the king used disappearance, and then a weapon appeared in his hands, with which he began to attack the guy. Bane was in a stupor. The orc king struck a powerful blow right on the ground where the guy was standing. The girls shouted his name, and a shock wave passed through the ground. Aisha tried to call the guy, as they saw that the guy was holding the blade of the weapon. He pushed the king's weapon away with his blade. The orc asked if the guy really thought he would survive if he could finally beat off his blow. Main's steel knife split. The guy thought that even though it was broken now, it was not in vain. After all, she was able to repel the blow of the orc king. Main took away the skills of king intimidation, materialization and special magic of space and time from the orc. Main used his skills to order the orcs to release the girls right now. The orc king shouted that he would then attack without limiting his power. Suddenly, Main used an all-encompassing magic, fire. The princess turned around in shock, and the guy shouted for them to get out quickly. The princess grabbed Aisha's hand and told her to run, because because of them, the guy has to restrain his strength. Main made a punch, now both of his knives were broken. He has almost no mana left, and his weapon is broken. The guy will have to go hand to hand. He suddenly remembered about the materialization skill and thought that he still had a weapon left. Suddenly, the guy was surrounded by an incomprehensible light. Aisha noticed that the young man's right hand was glowing. Main stretched out his hand and shouted for the weapon to appear. The Holy Sword of the Celestial Empire appeared in his hands. Aisha wanted to rush to the guy, but the sylph grabbed the girl, stopping her. The princess said that now the king is completely focused on the mine, 
Their intervention will be useless. Main gritted his teeth and thought that if he couldn't win quickly, then the sword would consume all his strength. The guy charged. His blow severed the orc's arm. The young man was shocked by how easily the two varying cuts through the hard skin of the orc king. It was incredible. With a quick movement, the young man hit the orc king's other arm, and then used the leg reinforcement to jump up. Main fought the orc king, but two varying's blows were no longer so strong. The orc said that it looked like such a small body was simply not capable of using this power to its maximum. The orc king quickly hit the guy and told him to know his limit. Main was lying on the ground, and the king laughed, calling the young man a weakling, when suddenly he noticed something. He turned around and saw some kind of light. It turned out that there were girls behind him. The princess screamed at Aisha to heal the mine while the sylph tried to distract the king. The young man used a small reinforcement of his legs and paws. He rushed at the king using the insert skill. A guy with a tubering in his hands rushed at the orc king, cutting him in half. The monster slowly fell to the ground, and a young man landed next to him, breathing heavily. Tubering disappeared, the guy thought that his strength had run out and he was devastated. After that, the guy slowly began to fall exhausted, but Aisha caught him. He told the girl that he was very glad that she was okay. He apologized and said he shouldn't have used such powerful magic around her. After a while, they returned to the city. The sylph apologized for causing so much trouble and thanked the guy for the delicious tea. Aisha also joined in the girl's words. The sylph started talking about the guy's fight with the king. She said that the guy used more than four skills in that battle. The girl asked if she could find out where the guy got such power from. Main apologized and said that even though they had saved him, he couldn't tell them about it. The sylph said that the guy didn't seem to understand who she was, if he knew, but he would be so arrogant. The guy saw the status of the princess and went into shock. He suddenly fell off his chair full of confusion and said something was rude on his part. He asked her for forgiveness, not knowing what to do. Main sat down at the table and apologized for what had happened. He would never have thought that he could see the princess, but now they were sitting at the same table. The girl said that, to be honest, she does not consider herself too important, so that for the rest of her life, at least once, but it is possible to meet her. Morning came. Main slept for a long time. It was already light outside the window. He got up and smelled a delicious smell. The guy went out into the kitchen, where the girls were sitting. Aisha said that breakfast was ready and ready, and the sylph called him Sonia. Main greeted the girls sheepishly. They sat down to eat the breakfast that Aisha had prepared. The food was very tasty. The guy found out that the girls went to the market for groceries. The girl said that when she was an adventurer, she also lived in Rukas, so she has a lot of friends. She was glad that no one had changed much. Main only realized that the girl was an adventurer, not just a receptionist at the guild. The sylph said that Aisha was much stronger than her, because she was so skilled with a bow that they even began to call her the Holy Bow of Aisha. The princess looked at the guy carefully and he realized that she wanted the guy to scan Aisha. The guy mentally apologized for doing this during the conversation. While Aisha was telling something, Main scanned her and saw that she was strong. The girl was an adventurer of a rank higher than Ryle. The sylph asked if he wanted to form a clan with them, with Main as the leader. The guy asked what it was. The girl explained that it was something like her own guild, which needed the king's permission to create. If you get it, you get special privileges. The clan can accept requests from an aristocrat and even the royal family, because confidentiality is respected within it. Because of this feature, the personal data of the clan members is protected by the country. The guy asked if they could form a clan of three, to which the sylph replied that it depended on the king. There are a little more than 10 clans in this country, but only three can be called great. The sylph said that she would take the body of the orc king and the general to show to her father, because in that case the chance of approval would increase. She also said that it would take about five days to process the application, so she would not be able to return in the evening. Aisha also said that she needed to go to the Royal Capital Guild to apply for dismissal, but she would be back by evening. The guy understood everything, and the girls were about to leave when suddenly he stopped them. Main wished the girls a safe journey, to which they replied that they would be back soon. Main went to the store, calling the man uncle. The owner was very surprised and asked what happened. The man apologized and said that he was putting the weapon in order, because everyone was buying it today for some reason. Main said that he actually came to buy swords, and the previous ones were broken. This surprised the man very much. The man looked at the blade and said that it was completely broken, despite the fact that this time it was made of diamond. The guy replied that it happened during the battle with the king of the orcs. The man was shocked, and Main hastened to correct himself, saying that it was a high-level orc. Main saw a short black sword that had a growth property. He told his uncle that he would take it. The man offered to look at another sword. 
he said that he got this short sword from a close friend. When he used it, the sword was enveloped by lightning. The man said that as soon as the friend died, the power of lightning disappeared from this sword. He said that it was perfectly sharpened for a short sword, and then asked if the young man wanted to hold it in his hands. Main agreed and took the blade. It really contains the power of lightning. It seems to overwhelm him. The man asked Main to show the true shape of the sword again, to which the young man replied that he would try. He thanked his uncle for this sword and said that when he returned the power of lightning to him, he would definitely show it. After a while, Main jumped up using a stone dissection. He used the insert skill on a large monster and then gave a sign to Aisha. The girl who was ready to attack took the signal and fired several shots directly at the monster. They worked great. Main said that these ogres were strong opponents. The girl was surprised that the ogre was able to create stones to attack them, but the guy said that this was their main ability. Suddenly a wall opened up in front of them and they saw a staircase leading down. Main asked the girl about the stone nearby, to which she replied that it was a displacement stone. If you touch it, it will send you straight to the entrance to the dungeon. The same stone is there, it will take you to this place. The girl said that there were trolls downstairs, and the guy replied that it was better to leave them for tomorrow. They came up and touched the stone. They were indeed transported to the entrance in an instant. Main thought that the orc king had such an ability. The girl offered to go look for a place to sleep. They went out into the city. He was quite lively despite the fact that it was already evening. Aisha explained that there are many adventurers full of energy living here. It was the dungeon capital of Adoru, a city in the north of Rukasa. It's mostly adventurers who come here looking for materials. Main came here for the resources for his beginner's short sword. The girl pointed to the sword in the shop and said that it looked like a guy's blade. They came up and greeted the merchant. Main thought that he already had a beginner's one-handed sword and bow, so Aisha and Sylphie would be able to use them. The merchant told the guy that if he was going to go to the dungeon, it was better not to take this sword. Although these weapons fall from monsters and are quite rare, they are very weak. Main asked Aisha if it was worth taking it, because he didn't want to think that this weapon was so terrible. The girl suggested making it a starting point. The couple took a bow and a sword. The man thanked them for the purchase, but repeated his words. Main said he was already hungry, so he suggested looking for a place to sleep. The girl agreed, saying that it would be nice to find an inexpensive place. The guy awkwardly took the girl's hand and said, There are so many people around them, so they should hold hands so as not to get lost. Aisha called the guy's name in embarrassment. The couple found a place that looked quite expensive, but the other hotels were already packed. Besides, they had money. Suddenly, a hand appeared on the guy's face. A human-like creature with the ears of a beast greeted the young man at the Silver Bell Manor, calling him a cute boy. Aisha saw this and exclaimed, and the creature asked if it was the boy's older sister. Main exclaimed that it was his wife. The creature clung to the young man and said that then he would show them to an empty room. The cost per guest is one gold coin. Aisha pushed the creature away and asked to accompany them. The couple were taken to a great room, where there was even a healing bath. Main asked if they thought the room was too spacious. The creature left the room, thinking about how naive the guests were. Main put his hand in the water, which turned out to be quite hot. Aisha wondered where all this steam was going. Meanwhile, Sylphie was in Castle August. The girl was walking down the corridor when her brother called out to her. He had already heard about the girl's engagement. The prince said he should be the one to recognize her fiancé. He believed that a boy from a simple family did not have a strong enough ability. He told the princess, wouldn't his brother be able to accept this? The girl simply replied that her husband was a man who had defeated the orc king. Besides, her father had already given permission for the marriage. The guy said he was waiting to meet him. Sylphie replied that she would not allow them to meet, so that Main would not catch the prince's ardor. Sylphie opened the doors and asked her father if the permission to create a clan was ready. The girl saw a guy next to her father. The king said that the girl had a guest. The guy greeted the princess, saying that she looked damn adorable. The girl frowned, and the guy turned out to be Lord Roselle's heir, Claude. The sylph asked why Claude had come, because she had made it clear that she was refusing to be engaged to him. Claude heard something he couldn't agree with. He found out that the princess wants to marry a commoner who has nothing, and such an act will only stain the royal blood. For a country where the people and the nobility live, this is an act that will not be forgiven. Claude said he would be here. The guy asked to fight with the mine, and if he wins, the girl will refuse to marry him. He offered to find out if this commoner really deserved to be by her side. Let him prove it. Main goes back to the dungeon. He says in surprise that this is yesterday's place. After all, this stone of displacement is simply amazing. The girl says that he is right. It is a very convenient device. He says that if the princess had such a moving ability, she would be able to return home in the blink of an eye. 
She agrees and says that it would be great. She suggests that Maine should already go down. They go down into the dungeon and hear some sounds. The boy shouts to Aisha to run. She runs after him. She says there are basilisks on this floor. He should be careful of their claws. He replies that he understood her. At this time, Kisu and Ammon are fighting a huge bird monster that is majestically flapping its wings. Kisu shouts that he will take on this monster, and Ammon must take those who are injured and run with them. Ammon tells Kisu to stop joking. Does he really think that he let him risk his life? He shouts that they accepted him into their group, so even if he dies, he will thank them for their kindness. Kisu clicks irritably. Kisu says that he is a fool, since he decided to help, he would rather die, but not protect him, but the other members of the group. He looks around at the others, all lying wounded among the garbage and bleeding. Ammon is surprised by such words from Kisu. Kisu runs away with the monster and shouts that he is counting on him. Ammon stays and screams his name in horror. He turns to Alfred and Reese and tells them to wake up immediately. Whether they can hear, they don't have time to sleep here, because there is a Kisu. Of course they don't wake up because they are unconscious, because they are injured. Ammon shouts that it is a curse, decides to use the potion. He looks in the bag and realizes that it is missing. He keeps trying to wake up his friends, but all to no avail. At this time, Kisu barely escapes. He realizes that there seems to be petrification poison in these claws. He stops and says that without a doubt, if he gets these claws, he will become a B rank very soon, so he decides to take them away. He attacks. The bird does not touch him. Kisu complacently asks how he feels, but the bird knows him. He falls. One of the bird's paws was torn off, and with the other paw he pinched the kitty to the ground. He says to let him go, he doesn't have such preferences, he doesn't like it when the monster sits astride him. His hand begins to get covered with stones, the bird opens its mouth and screams. Kisu says that if he eats it, he will only spoil his stomach. The bird pulls away and prepares to finish off completely. Then Maine appears from above with his sword. Maine uses his martial art, the flaming shark. Kisu squints, not understanding what kind of destructive force it is. Maine lands. Kitty is surprised and says that it's like a real natural disaster. The girls run up to Kitty, who says that he sees that they are fine. They say that he is not, because his hand has turned into stone. Aisha quietly tells Maine that she told him not to overdo it. He asks her for forgiveness. Kisu is surprised by Aisha and Maine. Riza says they helped them. Kisu turns to them and thanks them for saving him. Man says he's glad they're okay. Ammon also thanks Maine. Kisu is asked why they came here. At the moment there are several reasons. One of them is the guild's morale has dropped significantly. In order to raise it, the enraged head of the guild gave an order according to which they should start exploring every corner of this dungeon. He says that with such a hand he will not get far. For him life is much more important than some kind of fighting spirit. Maine asks why he fell. Kisu hands them the shoes and says that it fell out of that chicken's leg. Let them take two pairs. Aisha is surprised to say that these are speed shoes, and she sees others for the first time. Maine asks if these are not Kisu's things. He replies that they don't need them, so they can throw them away if they don't need them either. Aisha thanks Kitty with delight. The four leave. Kisu tells them to try not to die there. They will see each other again. They say goodbye. Maine obeys him. Kisu says he can't believe that that kid has become so strong since that incident. Riza clarifies from what case. He says that a few days ago, when he was traveling to Rukasa in a cart, they were attacked by looters. Yes, it seemed to be a week ago, and Maine was riding in that wagon. He says that then he looked out of the wagon before anyone else. It could be called recklessness, maybe even courage. Ammon says that everything is fine. Maine is a teenager for whom the lives of other people are important. He understands this, because it was he who saved him. Kisu agrees. Ammon points at Alfred and asks why he is crying. He explains that the fact is that he loved Aisha very much. They tell him to give up on it. Aisha and Maine are walking through the cave. Maine asks if she thinks the dungeon is getting wetter. She replies that it is, because they are already close to the trolls, and they like the dampness, so he should look at his feet and be careful. He says he understood her. Maine tells Aisha to stand because it seems to him that someone is there. He uses his detection skill. He says it's slime. This wall is all masked slime. Aisha looks around. Suddenly it gets warm in the cave. Everything is paired. Aisha says it's steam. He says it really is. The temperature is the same as in that therapeutic bath. Maine thinks it was very pleasant back then. He tells himself that he shouldn't think about it now. He grabs Aisha's hand and tells her not to leave his side. It uses vision enhancement, full scan. He reads and thinks, I wonder what the point is. He begins to realize that they combine their abilities to create a pair. But is there any point in this pair if he does not cause any damage? Aisha asks him if he has noticed already. She says trolls love it when it's wet, but the slime keeps letting off steam. 
Bane uses wind magic, dissipates steam and realizes that huge trolls are standing right in front of them. The slime has been calling them all this time. Aisha tells Maine to be careful. Even though trolls are not particularly agile, they have a high recovery ability, this can be a big problem. Maine wonders what kind of recovery ability it is. It uses a full scan. He sees that they have regeneration, and at a high level. Maine tells Aisha to step back, he wants to test his strength. She is surprised that he is going to do it alone. Maine turns to Aisha and tells her not to worry. He's not overdoing it, Aisha agrees. Maine is preparing to attack. He thinks to test his recovery ability slightly first. He cuts off one troll's arm, after which he notices something and thinks, is it really because of the victory over the king of the orcs that his level has risen so much? When he killed the basilisk, he realized that he had put too much effort into it. If he continued like this, he might expose the others to attack. In anger, the troll attacks him. He manages to move away and sees that the arms that have just been torn off have already grown back. He meets the troll's gaze and immediately it hits him. He flies back, covers his eyes with his hands. He thinks, was it really just a magic eye flash attack? He tested his abilities. Aisha shouts at him not to let his guard down. The troll is not his only opponent. He looks around and sees how the slime covers him. He panics and screams, where did they get such power from? He can't get free. The troll looks at him, Maine does not understand what to do. Suddenly, all the slime is removed, he thanks Aisha for this, who saved him. She is standing with a bow. Aisha reflects that Maine is still not used to fighting a lot of opponents, apparently he has a habit of focusing on one thing. She understands that this monster is strong, she is too weak to defeat it, so she must do everything she can to help Mainu. Maine asks her if she saw the troll blow him away. She screams that no, she only saw the light shine in the troll's eyes. He thinks that, it turns out, if he uses this skill in front of people, it will not create any problems. He stretches out his hand and uses the flash of the magic eye, after which the monster has a wound on his arm. He says he can't heal these wounds anymore. He copes with all the trolls, Aisha looks at him admiringly. He says that they still manage to get the troll skin, and these slugs continue to create steam. Aisha asks if he remembers yesterday's healing bath while looking at him. Aisha covers herself from the steam. Maine asks if the steam has become even more, if they really want to summon the troll again. They hear a sound and turn to him. Maine asks what that earth-shaking rumble is, she says it's the sound of footsteps. She says that this is a monster that exceeds the strength and body size of the Orc King, with better regeneration than ordinary trolls, the owner of this dungeon level, a monster that continues to take the lives of many adventurers. She says that this is a monster of destructive level, a wandering troll caretaker. She says that even though his movements are not fast, but he is on the same level with the Orc King in strength, they should run at the first opportunity. Nain thinks that he is on the same level as the Orc King. He really has two incredible abilities. He is preparing to attack and thinks that for him it is just a big monster. Aisha suggests he should back off. Nain activates the weapon and tells Aisha that he will kill him and let her return through the displacement stone. Aisha sees the light and realizes that it is the same one as in the battle with the Orc King. A bright light is on. After a while, they all ride in a wagon with other adventurers. Maine sleeps on Aisha's shoulder. The girl reflects that it is simply unthinkable that he really managed to defeat the wandering troll of the caretaker. She believes that he is too strong. She understands that he still has little experience in real battles, so he can easily get into a dangerous situation. She and the princess will have to give him maximum support. For the sake of the mind she must become as strong as possible. However, what if in a place where neither she nor the princess will be around? She wonders what if something irreversible happens to him. Maine asks her if everything is okay. He says she looks tired. She says not to worry, she's fine. She asks, because he is much more tired. He replies that since he slept the whole train, he feels much better already. He apologizes for the fact that he was the only one who rested. She says he was sleeping so soundly that she couldn't find the strength to wake him up. She says she can already see Lucas from here. They go out and say goodbye to the others. They walk freely on the streets of the city. Maine says that Lucas is much quieter after all. Aisha agrees and says that she likes this city too. They greet people on the way. A merchant recognizes Aisha and asks if she has just returned to Lucas. She introduces Maine to Roku as her husband and says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. She got married in this city, so now she lives in it. She tells Maine that Roku is a very skilled carpenter. It was he who created the bath for the guild. He is interested in the bath. She says that she has created the same bathtub as in the Silver Bell Manor. Who is surprised? Roku says that. So they have already been to the estate of the Chi Cat. The bath was made there by none other than him. 
Main apologizes and asks if he could make a similar tub in his house. His cheeks are red, and Aishai is surprised at such a request. They come to their house, Roku says that this is Dain's house. He could not have imagined that the boy Main would turn out to be his son. He asks if he really knew his father. He replies that, of course, he knew, there is no one in Lucas who would not know Dinah and Yukino. Aisha reflects that in her childhood there was a legendary bowmaker, a man she admired so much, and his name was Dain. Main says that the father, it turns out, was so famous. Aisha wonders if this is possible. Roku turns to Dane's son and asks if he has magic tools. He asks again. Roku says that one is to pump water out of the well, and the other is to make it hot in the tub. He adds that they are too expensive, in total these tools cost 2,000 gold. He is surprised that they are so expensive. Roku confirms and says that this is why baths are mostly available either to the royal family or the nobility. Main thinks that 2,000 gold is too much. He thinks about the hot water and wonders if the slime didn't do something similar. He remembers something. Main says that he will prepare these magic tools so that he can make a bath. He says he can. He doesn't have any important things right now, so he can start work by tomorrow. Roku says that in that case he will bring his apprentices here soon and they will discuss the work process together. Main says he's counting on them, and they say goodbye. Aisha asks him if he can definitely prepare these magical tools, he replies that he can. Let her not worry. He himself hopes inside that everything will work out. Main says she's going to the barn, because the trolls need to be butchered anyway, and she can rest at home for now. She agrees and says that she will go relax a little until the master comes. He goes into the barn and thinks that this is the house that his father left him, the barn that he used. In this dear place for him, for the sake of those who have become a new family for him, he wants to create a better bath. He runs his hand along the wall and says that before he starts butchering trolls, he will first go create magic tools. That movement stone is from the dungeon's power. Its power is very similar to the one used by the Orc King for instantaneous movements. This monster's abilities were materialization and royal submission. He reflects that if the king, using this ability, could move in space, then it means that he can move in the same way as with the help of the displacement stone. He needs to connect with him. First he will try to use a mental image, using space and time. He needs to remember that place with slugs and the power of the dungeon. He finds himself in that cave. A hole has formed in front of him. He notices that steam is coming out from the other side of the hole. He says it can't be, there are slugs ahead. He takes a step forward and enters this hole. He says inside the same cave that there can be no mistake, this is the power of the dungeon. He is surprised, because the journey from Lucas to here takes half a day by wagon. He sees that the hole has disappeared, he thinks that its validity period has expired. He tells himself that there is no time to be surprised. The steam begins to thicken, Main says that he does not use the impossibility of detection just in case, he needs to have time to make magic tools before the master comes. He finds something on the ground and says that this stone will become his magic tool. He keeps thinking, if he inserts this ability into this stone, then the stone begins to flow, the stone seems to be covered with slime. He is happy that he has succeeded and this is a real success. He says it would be great if he could make this stone stop flowing whenever he wants. If he thinks right, then this should definitely work. Using the special magic of space and time, he will stop the time of the stone. The stone stops flowing. He shouts that it has stopped, it turned out exactly as he wanted. Now all that remains is to make sure that this stone also heats up. He tries and shouts that the water is heating up. He thinks maybe he can make some more of these stones. He thinks three will be enough after trying on five. Steam is coming out of the stone. He looks and says that he has succeeded. It remains only to find out if it will be possible to make a healing bath out of it. He's scanning. He sees that the heat added to the magic water has made it hot water with magical healing. He is surprised that ordinary water has become magical. It turns out that the troll is panicking. He has nothing with which he can fight against him, so he needs to leave as soon as possible. He changes his mind because he looks at his sword and remembers the troll's regeneration ability. If you take this short sword that broke during the battle with the orc king, he wonders if it will work. Then Aisha calls him from the hole and says that the master is already on the way. The troll hears and turns to Maine, and he is surprised that the voice reaches even here. The troll attacks in anger, the mine goes into the hole, manages to cut out regeneration and goes out into the barn, but then the troll's hand catches it. Aisha comes into the barn and asks if he is here. She asks in surprise why this hand is above him. He says he screwed up a bit with butchering the troll. Aisha says that the master and his apprentices are already waiting in the living room. He thanks her. He notices that his little sword is recovering and covered in steam. Now he has the ability to regenerate. 
Aisha hears his surprise and asks him what is the matter. He replies in a panic that it's nothing. He thinks that if you add the ability to regenerate to a weapon, then it can be restored. It's a little disgusting somehow, but very convenient. Aisha asks if he was able to repair that short sword. The craftsmen come to their house, they inspect everything. Build, lift, mine approves everything. After a while, Maine is delighted to say that he simply has no words. They have built such an amazing bath. Aisha is also happy. He replies that since this is Dane's house, then working carelessly would be an outrage on him. So they decided to make a bath that would be even better than in the royal palace. Radu says that they leave then, after all, they work for three whole days without sleep. Maine tells Aisha that it is immediately obvious that they are professionals, because they built such a gorgeous bathroom in just three days. Maine says that since there is no ceiling, they will be able to enjoy the sky. Aisha adds that thanks to these windows, no one will be able to see them inside this room, so you can relax in peace and no one will bother them. Aisha says that because of the direct sunlight, the smell of the trees can be felt here, it seems as if the bath is in the morning forest, she simply has no words. Maine says he is so glad to see her so happy. Aisha opens her eyes and looks surprised. Maine says that since they returned from Adora, she was a little depressed, so he was worried. He wants everyone in his family to just smile. Then the princess comes, calls her husband and Aisha and says that she has returned home. Maine says that Sylphie has come. She says that she is sure that if the princess sees this bath, she will be very surprised. They want to show her this tub as soon as possible. They open the door and greet her with a smile. Then they stand in disbelief and ask who it is. The guy next to the princess asks what she is doing here. Aisha immediately recognizes his majesty Arudo. His majesty says that, so he is married not only to his sister, but also to the lady Holy Onion. He says that from his appearance, you can't tell that he has enough strength to protect two women at once. Did he really manage to defeat the Orc King? The princess asks her brother if he really wants to say that her words were a lie. He says that in no case, because she never lies, he only suspects this guy of lying, nothing more. The princess apologizes to her husband and says that her brother has a very severe form of a sisterly complex, which is why he behaves so complacently. She tells him to just ignore him, although even if given the chance, then kill him. Maine says she said it too loudly, and he won't be able to do it. My brother says it's a great offer. He asks Maine if he would like to fight him. Maine looks at him suspiciously. My brother says that he just wants to make sure that he is really a man who is able to protect his women. The princess protects and tells her brother not to talk nonsense. Their marriage has already been approved by their father. There is no reason to fight with him. The brother tells Sylphie that she is very dear to him as a sister. He will not accept any man next to her until he can trust him. Maine turns to him and asks him to let him fight him. He wants to prove to him that Sylphie is also dear to him as a member of the family. And not only Sylphie, but also Aisha. The brother says that he understands his view and suggests starting. Women on the sidelines are delighted by this. They go out into the open space. My brother says that although they will not use real swords, they can still cause serious damage, so let them not lose their vigilance. He replies that he understood him. The brother says that there is no time limit. If one of them turns off or gives up, it will mean his defeat. He agrees. Aisha asks him if he is sure. Sylphie says that his brother wanted to fight with him. He does not have to agree. Maine says he said he wanted to check on him, and so did he. If they hadn't been there then, the Orc King would have killed him for sure, so he wants to find out if he has the power to protect them. He just wants to find out. Sylphie says that she understood him. Well, then let him punch her brother with all his heart, but let him not forget that they trust him even without this battle. Maine thanks them and prepares for battle. His brother immediately tells him that he knows about his two abilities, so he can look at him without hesitation. He sees his characteristics and thinks that his abilities are just like the king's. Is he even stronger than his father? Aruto reflects that he is using a full scan. He does not know what he sees there, but everything is written on his face anyway. Aruto shouts that he is starting. He shouts that he is ready. The battle begins. Aruto disappears from his seat and finds himself behind Maine. Maine uses an iron wall, squints and thinks what kind of speed is this, he moved in the blink of an eye. Aruto disappears again. Maine uses medium vision enhancement and sees the silhouette of Aruto right from the side. He thinks in horror, wasn't he far away from him? He manages to put out his sword and deflect the blow. He realizes that it is hard, it seems as if he is about to be crushed. He copies Aruto's abilities and starts moving fast too, Aruto is surprised. Man thinks he's finally been able to use this ability. He ends up behind Aruto, but he disappears, leaving behind the shoes he sealed. 
he just took it off. Aruto hits Mane from behind. He flies far away and falls. The girls are worried about him and call his name out of fright. Aruto shouts that they are still fighting, so they shouldn't interfere. If they help him in any way, then he will have to accept defeat. Aruto thinks how to understand this at all. The boy who is able to defeat the Orc King continues to laugh at his abilities. He asks him if he is exhausted already, and he replies that he is not yet. He gets up thinking that he still couldn't do anything. He thinks that he needs to at least strike once. Aruto thinks that's right, let him show him his power in action. Main reflects that if it didn't work out to use copying, then how does he like it? He uses the magic of support, namely reducing the speed. Aruto doesn't understand what's going on because he feels like his body has become so heavy. The mind moves with the help of wind magic. Aruto sees this and doesn't understand what he's using her for. He reflects that if he uses this as a smokescreen, then he will attack from above. As he predicted, the mine will attack from above. Aruto is moving. Main does not understand how, because he used a speed reduction for him. He thinks that by increasing his speed, he has deactivated the ability that he put on him. Sylphie says that, of course, she knows that her brother is strong, but so that Main, who was nicknamed the Killer of Catastrophes, could not touch either his hands or his feet. Main reflects that despite the fact that His Majesty has only three abilities, no matter how many he has, he still feels this huge difference in strength. Aruto thinks to himself that Main is still abusing his abilities, he relies on them too much. Due to the lack of real combat experience, he attacks only head-on. But he certainly knows that when fighting a strong opponent, he should at least try to read his movements. Now he can't protect the two girls, he can't even protect himself. Aruto turns up behind Main and says it's too slow. If it was a real battle, he would have been dead three times already. Main pulls away from him and realizes that he is too fast. He should not be allowed to attack from behind. He begins to realize that he is constantly going behind his back. He pushes off the ground and thinks he should try. He is attacking. Now his highness Aruto will definitely go behind him. At this moment he should be able to strike. Aruto manages to deflect the blow with his sword. Main thinks that he could. For the first time his highness had to defend himself. Aruto tells him that this is great. Now he has managed to read his movements. Main realizes that he has known about his every move all this time. Main tells himself that he has to move much faster so that at least he can't read it like an open book. He uses the impossibility of detection. The girls see that he has disappeared. Aruto is also a little panicked. Aruto wonders what he's up to, even though he doesn't see his figure, but realizes that he's just running around him, although his movements are still too clumsy. Aruto smiles and thinks, I wonder if he's doing this so that you can't see his movements. He's doing it, he can't read it. However, did he really decide to find out which of them is faster? Aruto is curious. He mentally says that when he was his age, carried him to pieces, showing their difference in strength. Main uses the flash of the magic eye and sees the silhouette of Aruto, who thinks that now it's his turn to teach him. He says he will teach him how to be the first prince and the eldest brother. However, Aruto is horrified. Main goes with a sword, the girls cover their mouths with their palms in fear. Aruto's sword touches Main's chest. Main coughs up blood. Main says with the intonation of a wind that he got to his body. Aruto thinks this can't be happening. Was he just trying to hurt him all this time? Sylphie screams at his brother that this is too much. Does he really want to kill him? She shouts at Aisha to heal him faster. They run towards them. In a panic, they drag him into the house to heal him. Evening comes, Sylphie looks at Aisha with sadness. Sylphie says she can't believe it came to this. She knew she shouldn't have brought her brother with her. Aisha tells her not to worry so much. Fortunately, Main is fine. Besides, she is glad that he and her brother were able to make friends. Sylphie knocks Ayesha's head and shouts that this is the problem. What will she do if her brother infects Main with his vehemence? Surely, as soon as the right moment came, he told Main something like to come to their castle. There he could train him, and after that their husband with a bald face would go after him. She screams that even now he left them alone. Even in her house it was her brother who first went to the bathroom with her husband. How jealous she is, just the thought that they are there together makes her head hurt. Aisha is worried. Sylphie turns to Sylphie and says that she probably wants to rub her husband's back too, like a wife, after all, that's what she wants too. Aisha tells the princess that in fact, when she and Maine went to Adora, they stayed in the same mansion where there was a similar bathtub, and they took it together. She immediately apologizes and says it doesn't mean she wanted to leave her behind or anything like that. She says that everything is fine. She did what she had to do, she is his wife, 
This is quite normal, although she is really a little jealous. Here Sylphie begins to wonder if her brother's relationship with her husband is better than hers. She stops talking and thinks. She analyzes the situation. He comes and challenges him to a duel, and then causes a serious injury. Now they are in the bath together, how much will he bother her at all? Sylphie takes the sword and says she can't take it anymore, she has to kill him. He's unarmed now, so even she has a chance to defeat him. Aisha screams that she is saying this, that you can't do that. Sylphie says not to stop, to let her go there as soon as possible. She stops and says that it is impossible. In the bathtub in the dead of night, Aruto apologizes to Maine for what happened. Because of his fault he suffered so much. Maine says that you shouldn't worry so much, thanks to Aisha's healing and a therapeutic bath, he is already completely healthy. Aruto says that this bath is still amazing. It can heal damaged organs and broken bones so quickly. Maine thinks that he can't say that only with the help of regeneration he was able to heal so quickly. However, one should still think about inserting this ability into some kind of stone, so that if he gets seriously injured in front of people, he can quickly heal himself without suspicion. And yet, because he wanted to get his majesty's recognition so badly, he used too many abilities. For sure, Aruto thinks that he is abnormal. Aruto says that having over four abilities is cool. He surprised him. However, he doesn't know how to use them at all. Relying too much on his abilities, all he does is attack head-on. He starts shouting, poking him in the forehead, that this is the worst thing, his movements are too easy to read, he needs to train properly, stop relying only on his abilities. He explains using the example of water, if its current moves only in one direction, then he will easily be able to read where he will sail next, just like in battle. He can anticipate the opponent's next move in advance. He asks what he will do if he cannot read the flow of movements. It sounds simple, but the best option is to change it yourself. At the very end, his movements were no longer as bad as they were at the beginning, as he thought through various attack options. They became more difficult to predict. Bane guiltily says that in the end he read them anyway. Aruto says it wasn't reading. He just created a new stream that directed him to it. If he does not understand which way the current is moving, you need to create your own. This is the basis of the basics. He says that he always aimed directly at his gap in defense. Realizing this, he took up such a stance that would leave his left side completely unprotected. To repel his attack, Aruto only had to sense where he was attacking from, of course. He completely ignored the right side. He says that, true, he really took a lot of risks, but he did not know what other abilities he had hidden. And this made him nervous enough. There is silence. Main looks expectantly at Aruto who calms down and tells him not to make such a worried face. However, Aruto unexpectedly says that for the sake of Sylphie, he would not think of telling anyone about his abilities, of course, and the king would not do it either. Main is surprised that all this is just for Sylphie's sake. Aruto says that even though he defeated the Orc King, his father still doubted his strength, which is why he wanted to learn more about it from his sister. Sylphie has sworn to protect her husband with all her might, so not a single word will come out of her mouth that would be able to betray his secrets. She knows that this is selfish and ignorant of her, so she asks the king to accept her apology. However, if he cannot forgive her, she is ready to be punished for all her actions. The king stared sternly at first, and then grinned. He starts laughing out loud and says that's what you'd expect from his daughter. He gets up from his throne and says that the only one here who should ask for forgiveness is himself. He wants her to forgive him for trying to find out her husband's secrets. Aruto smiled at this situation, and his daughter looked at him gratefully, which she later said that she thanked him from the bottom of her heart for his generosity. Maine, upon learning about this, says that this cannot be, Sylphie was ready to be punished just to protect him. He remembers the words so that he forgets that they trust him completely anyway. He begins to think and cry that, despite this, he only thought about his highness recognizing him. Aruto gets up and tells him to save his regrets for later. He asks if he wants to use his mysterious power to protect Sylphie and this country. He is surprised by such a question. He asks if he knows a man named Claude Rosilia, an ill-mannered and sick-in-the-head man. He only cares about money and position in society, a truly disgusting man. Maine says he has not heard of such a thing. He says that he managed to find out from a trusted source that something dangerous had fallen into his hands. Otherwise, Claude Rosilia got his hands on a magical monster with the power to destroy the country. The power of dragons surpasses even the most massive natural disasters. One flap of their wings can take down all the trees in their path. Two flaps can cause a tornado that will destroy an entire city and their anger threatens to be the end for the country. Maine listens enthusiastically. Aisha asks if he really wants to say that this Claude wants to tame a dragon. Aruto says no. He got his hands on one young black dragon, 
Most likely they just stole it from the nest. Nain asks if he's talking about the cub, what does he need it for? He suggests that, perhaps for the sake of money, dragons are very rare monsters, therefore their prices are high. Maybe he knows about the rarity of the dragon, but most likely he does not understand its danger. If the parent of a cub finds out that his child has been kidnapped by people, he will indiscriminately begin to destroy everything in his path. In order to prevent this, they must return this cub. Aruto says that he planned that together they could capture Claude and extract information about the dragon from him. Aruto says that recently he unexpectedly came to an audience with the king and declared that he was against their engagement with Sylphie. He says that Claude said he wanted to challenge him to a duel, stipulating that if he won, they would end the engagement. Vane is surprised by the duel with him, but how does he know that he is the husband of Sylphie? He says that Claude Roselia's house is located in Lucas. He suddenly saw Sylphie walking around his city and decided to find out what purpose she came there for. Aruto says that more than one aristocrat wants to marry Sylphie, respectively, Claude is no exception. Maine and Aisha are surprised. Even though she has already refused him, he believes that if he does not give up, he will be able to get the position and power of the royal family. He plans to get Sylphie in his hands by any means. Aisha says that there is no need for Maine to accept the challenge. The princess has already refused Claude. Aruto says that he won't just leave it like that. As he said, he planned to grab him at that moment and force him to tell about the dragon. He abruptly turns to Maine and asks if he wants to accept his challenge. To be honest, in fact, this is a direct request from the king, so Aruto asks as his representative. Aruto says that they must catch Claude and the people he hired to steal the baby dragon. There is no point in catching only this dog, because until they catch all the culprits, they will not be able to hush up this case. Maine asks him how it will help them if he accepts his challenge. Aruto replies that he is sure that no matter what tricks Claude uses, he will win anyway. If they use him as bait, then. Then Maine guesses and says that he will surely, if he loses, call for the help of those mercenaries. Then Sylphie turns to him and says that she wants him to refuse. She says that all the problems with Claude concern only her. She does not want their marriage to be tainted by disgusting quarrels. She did not offer to marry her in order to be used as bait, so she wants him to refuse. Maine tells her that her problems are now his, because she is his wife. If she finds herself in a difficult situation, then he will certainly help her. Sylphie blushes, Maine says that, besides, he himself wants to return the baby dragon to his parents. Aisha puts her hand on Sylphie's arm and says that it's not worth keeping everything to herself, she accepts support. Naruto slaps Maine on the shoulder and thanks him, he says that they will all rely on his strength. He asks if he didn't use that secret power that could kill him back then, Maine swallows. He screams in panic that he doesn't have that kind of power. He laughs and asks why he is being so modest. Maine says he's wrong. Aisha and Sylphie turn around and think that, after all, if he had used a two-varing, he would most likely have cut his brother in half. Aruto tells Maine to stop referring to him as his highness, he is now his older brother. He says that Sylphie always calls him brother, so he can call him that too. Sylphie wonders when she ever addressed him like that at all. Aruto laughs at this reproach and asks not to pay attention to all sorts of little things. Let him call him brother, Maine is going to say so, Sylphie stops him, saying that he will get infected with stupidity. They accompany Aruto, and he thanks Maine for letting him stay the night. He says that he is also grateful that he taught him a lesson. Aruto says that he is returning to the castle to report everything to the king, but he sincerely asks them not to forget that they are responsible for their actions. He gets into the cart and tells me not to forget that Claude lives in Lucas. They think they haven't even said anything. Aruto says he will inform you when the date of the fight is set. He stops and tells Sylphie that she has met wonderful companions, he hopes that she will be happy. He leaves, Maine says what a wonderful brother his majesty Aruto is, so strong and cool. Aisha agrees with him, Sylphie turns away and says he's just a selfish prince with a sister complex. She secretly smiles and thanks her brother. Aisha and Maine run after her and ask her to wait. Sylphie says that, however, as her brother said, until they figure it out, it's better not to disclose their relationship. If they make a fuss in the city, then Claude's family will 100% do something bad. She says that it is probably worth meeting with the mayor of the city and asking him for help. Aisha agrees and says that it will be much more reliable this way. Someone sees them from behind. Sylphie says she needs to be informed that she now lives in Lucas. She asks Aisha if she wants to go with him to the mayor of the city, she agrees. The girl behind recognizes the lane. Sylphie turns to Maine and asks if he didn't tell anyone that they were married. 
He shakes his head. Sylphie asks him not to say a word to anyone yet that he is married to the first princess. Then that girl hugs Maine from behind and wishes him a good morning with all her love. Maine is embarrassed. This is the wife of the owner of the alchemy shop. Sylphie stares intently. That girl understands and shouts that Maine's wife is a princess. They all shut her up and tell her that it's wrong. Let it be quieter, you can't scream here. They all go into a corner. People are discussing whether someone shouted something. Sylphie turns to the girl and tells her to follow her. Later, Maine explains everything and says that this is why he would like his relationship with Sylphie to remain a secret. That girl says how wonderful it is to take the princess of their nobility. When did he manage to become such an adult? The girls are discussing that she probably misunderstood everything. She turns to Maine and tells him to try to protect the princess from those aristocrats. His sister fully supports him. They're wondering what they're talking about. My sister tells Maine not to worry. She won't tell anyone, even if my sister is very talkative. But she promises that she will restrain herself. Mainu felt a little uneasy. He thinks he may not have told her anything about the dragon, but will everything be alright? The sister bows to the wives and asks them to take care of the mine. She says she has to go already. She tells Mena to try her best there, and she asks Aisha and the princess to come to tea. They say goodbye. Sylphie says that she is worried about this young lady, but even so, she thinks that she should hurry to the mayor of the city. Aisha agrees with her. She turns to Maine and asks what he will do if he will go with them. He refuses and says that he has other things to do. There's a place he'd like to go. Aisha says that then they will go together. Sylphie says that they will meet at home. The girls come to the mayor. The secretary tells the mayor of Samob that Her Majesty Sylphido and Mrs. Aisha have come to see him. The mayor greets him joyfully. Sylphie apologizes for disturbing him. The fact is that he and Aisha got married in Lucas, so they came to say that they will live here. The mayor shouts that this is incredible. He wholeheartedly congratulates them. He will immediately start planning a congratulations ceremony. Sylphie refuses and says that she would like to ask him not to disclose it yet. He apologizes and says that he understands everything perfectly. Samaba asks who became her husband after all. Is it really the Honorable Mr. Claude? She says that it wasn't him. She and Aisha married a young man from ordinary townspeople together. He is surprised. She says that maybe he knows him, or maybe not, but this young man lives outside this city. And just recently he came of age. His name is Maine. The mayor says that he knows this guy very well. He is a precious gift left by Din and Yukino. He is happy for her from the bottom of his heart. Aisha says she knew that, so the mayor knows who Maine's parents are. Sylphie asks what she means. She says that quite recently, the master who came to them to build a bathtub said that there are no such people in Lucas who would not know Maine's parents. The mayor says it's natural. There really aren't any people in this city who don't know about these two. The mayor says he is unlikely to be able to explain everything to them in detail, but they saved this city. Now Lucas exists only because of them. To them, these two are heroes. The girls are surprised to ask if Maine's parents were the heroes who saved Lucas. In front of the graves of Dane and Yukino, Maine stands and apologizes for not visiting them since the day he came of age. He says he brought sunflowers. He remembers that they were his mother's favorite flowers. He says that the fact is that he is now married, and to two at once. They are not inferior in beauty even to his mother. They are very affectionate, very kind. In fact, he has a secret that he is hiding from them. He stole one person's abilities from him. He is afraid of what will happen if they find out about it, so he cannot tell them. But still, he is sure that they will forgive him. They will definitely not be afraid of him. But he so wants them to support him, wants them to give him advice on how to proceed. His parents stand behind him and ask if this is really all, and only this question torments him. All he needs is just to have the courage and tell them the truth without a shadow of fear. Since they completely trust him, the mother is sure that everything will be fine, so let her try to talk to them. Maine imagines that they would say that. He says he understands. He begins to shed tears bitterly. He says he wants them to tell him anyway. He wants to hear their voices so much. He asks them to come back. He wants them to meet Aisha and Sylphie, wants to laugh together and spend time with the whole family. He's squeezing the grass. Suddenly, Aisha and Sylphie appear next to each other. Sylphie begins to speak, addressing them as father and mother, asking them to let her introduce herself. Her name is Sylphie August. She and Maine have recently become husband and wife. She promises that she will protect him with all her might instead of the two of them. So she asks them to sleep peacefully. Aisha cries and apologizes for introducing herself so late. Her name is Aisha Lolru. She is also the wife of Maine. And in order not to shame their name, they will keep the warmth of the hearth warm in the house they built. So he asks to look after the three of them. 
Bane sheds even more tears and tells her parents that, as they saw, they are very affectionate and kind. Suddenly, he hears a voice telling him to be a man, not to worry and just try. He turns around, they ask him if something has happened or maybe something is wrong. He smiles and says that everything is fine. He asks why they don't go back to their house. He tells them that he could not have imagined that they would come to the graves. He was very surprised when he saw them. Aisha says that the mayor of the city told them about his parents, so they thought they should come and greet them properly. Sylphie says that, to be honest, they were surprised when they met him there. They ask what kind of flowers he brought. He replies that these are sunflowers, they grew in his mother's native land. Sylphie says it's so weird, she hasn't even heard of them. Maine says that his mother used to grow them in their garden, but someone like him couldn't take care of them properly, so he gave their seeds to the owner of the flower shop. Aga says that these are really beautiful flowers. Maine says that there is some kind of expensive looking carriage in front of their house, who left it here. Here Claude comes out of it epically and says that he has finally returned, making the aristocrat wait, who specially came to meet him. They'll recognize him. Claude shouts, isn't it her highness Sylphie who came to them? It's a great honor for him that they still decided to accept his offer to fight. Sylphie says she doesn't remember her saying she agreed to this. Claude says there's a rumor going around town that Maine and the entire aristocracy are ready to fight for the princess. They understand that the conversation with their sister has clearly gone to the wrong step. Claude bends down and says that their battle will take place in the spirit forest. He has already received permission from the king, so he doesn't even dare to run away. Maine backs away and says he won't run away. Claude says it's so disgusting that her highness Sylphie lives in a shack like this, it's just mind-boggling. He swears that he will definitely get her out of this pathetic parody of a house. He says that what kind of house such are the abilities of the person living in it. The commoner living in this barn will never compare with him. He is probably very offended by his worthless parents who gave birth to him in such a poor house. Sylphie, in anger, screams at him to stop it. Maine is furious and says that he doesn't care if someone says that about him, but he will never forgive those who speak ill of his parents and the house they left him. Claude shouts at him how dare he. A commoner like him does not dare to obey the orders of the nobility. Sylphie shouts at Claude to stop. Get out of here immediately. If he continues to say that, then let him be sure that he will tear their agreement to fight to shreds. Claude tenses up and tells his servant that they are leaving. The poor old man listens. Finally, he says that he will make him regret his act, resist the nobility. He tells her highness that he has to take his leave. Claude drives off and glares at the others. At home, the old man is already shouting at him why he did this. It was a valuable vase given to his father by Maliko Dakis. Claude tells him to shut up. He shouts that he will not forgive this commoner. He speaks ill of Sylphie and says that she loves him, so why treat him like this? He walks into a room full of different adventurers and questionable people. One apologizes to Claude for the intrusion. Claude calls them robbers, who told them they could break into his houses while he was away. He says that if anyone finds out, the baby dragon will be found before he sells it. They think as if this could happen. Someone behind Claude says that there is no reason to worry, no one will be able to detect them so easily. Claude smiles and says that the ability to completely hide his presence is what you would expect from a half-beast. The man in the back with the fur says that the reason he called them is really easy money again. Claude says that it is, the benefits of the plan they are about to tell them will be even greater than what they will get by selling the dragon. He tells everyone that he wants them to use their abilities to enter the Forbidden Spirit Forest the day after tomorrow. The beastman assumes that it is there. Claude talks about the lair of the divine beast farrier. Claude says that if the collar of enslavement could turn even a dragon into a servant, with it he would even force a divine beast to serve him. One robber says that, it turns out, they need to put this thing back on the target's neck. Claude replies that, if we talk about the divine beast, he is sure that he can have a child and if he puts this collar on him, then he will also belong to him. He adds that he pays 100 platinum coins for each of them. The beastman says it's twice as much as for a dragon, but Claude wants to ask for something else. He says that a boy named Maine will also come to this forest. He wants them to fight this commoner properly and then kill him. If they do everything right, he will increase their reward several times. The beastman says it sounds great, so they agree. The man of that sister Mena humbly apologizes to the princess for the fact that his wife caused her so much trouble. She also sobs for forgiveness and says that she couldn't help herself and blab. He says that she can roast them on a fire or boil them in boiling oil. If the princess so desires, let her do with them whatever she wants. The princess excitedly says that she made a mistake this time too, so she asks them to raise their heads. Lane is sitting next to them and asks them to come up. Sylphie says that they put not only her in an awkward position, 
but also her husband. She says, however, do not let them think that she will forgive them, so the respected one should prepare to accept punishment. Maine is horrified by her words. Sylphie says that the fact is that Lucas has one famous lime tea that she really liked. She says that next time she should treat her to it. The tea leaves from which it will be brewed should be of the best quality. The woman begins to sob even more and rushes to the princess. Her husband tells her not to hug her highness just like that. Maine laughs and says it's great that everything ended well. Aisha tells Sylphie, as far as she knows, the mayor informed the people that these are just ordinary rumors. Fortunately, after that everyone calmed down. Sylphie says that she understands, and that she will have to thank the mayor properly later. Maine says that they hid this information so that Claude wouldn't find out about it. Does it make sense now to hide everything further? Sylphie says that maybe he's right, but it's better to keep quiet until the matter with the dragon is resolved. Maine thinks about it and agrees, thinking about the consequences if this information gets out. Aisha says that she could not have thought that Maine would start provoking Claude. Sylphie agrees and says that she was surprised herself. Maine apologizes and says that he just couldn't keep quiet when he started laughing at this house. Aisha says that on the contrary, they are very glad that he did so. Sylphie says that they also love this house very much, which his parents treated with such care. While they are living here, little by little, they begin to experience the same feelings as they do. The memories they left behind live in this house, as well as warmth and love. Sylphie says that's why when this Claude started to throw mud at him, she began to be overwhelmed with a feeling of anger. But when she noticed that not only she was angry, but he was also angry, it seemed to her that she and Aisha got a little closer to his heart. Aisha says that's why they were so happy. Maine blushes and remembers the words of his parents, so that he would be a man. Believe and tell them everything. He turns to Sylphie and Aisha and says that there is something he would like to tell them. He says it's about his ability and why he can use so many skills. He wants to tell it to them, his loved ones, whom he fully trusts, absolutely everything. The girls blush at these words. Aisha asks if he is sure, he says he is sure. He wants to tell them, he is here only because of them. Besides, after all, they are his family. Sylphie, sad, apologizes and asks him if he could wait a little longer with the conversation. She says she doesn't mind if he tells Aisha everything. She just doesn't have confidence that he can trust her. Could he wait a little while until she was sure of herself? They look at her sadly and in surprise. Sylphie stands up and bows. She apologizes for the fact that, because of her arrogance, she was so dismissive of his determination. Aisha tells him that she also wants to ask him not to tell her about it yet. Sylphie is surprised. She says that because it is very important, she wants to hear it, as a member of his family, along with the princess. Vane smiles and says he understands them. Then he asks to forgive him too, he decided everything himself, without even thinking about their feelings. Sylphie's feelings are very dear to him, so he will wait as long as it takes. Sylphie thanks both him and Aisha. He gets up and says that he will go while he trains, but he still needs to prepare for the fight with Claude. He says that if they want, they can help him with training. They're shy and say it's kind of a little embarrassing, doesn't it seem that way to him? Sylphie asks if he's sure she needs to be on top. Maine tells her to stay in that position. Maine is doing push-ups, Sylphie is sitting on him. He says that this is one of the exercises to train physical strength, which will help you become stronger, so said Aruto's older brother. Aisha stands aside and is embarrassed that he forces the princess to do such a thing. Sylphie is outraged that he told him about the strange ways of training. He told him that his speed was really worth praising, but his body strength and power were no good. He held out a piece of paper and said that the very basics were written here, he should practice every day using them. Nain reflects, even if he raised the level thanks to hunting and got used to his speed, but due to the fact that he could not become physically stronger, he lost even to some low-level slugs. He does push-ups and tells himself that he has to get as strong as possible. Then a man coughs it up and says it's a very primitive workout but he thinks he can figure out why he's using it. Sylphie shouts at Louis not to look. Louis is outraged at how much noise his sister is making. She tells him to keep quiet while he comes laughing towards them. Louis says he's pleased to meet Maine. He is the second prince of the kingdom of Augusta, Louis Augusta. He counts on him as an older brother. Sylphie says it's her little brother. They are surprised by another prince. Sylphie asks why he came here. It's unusual to see him on the street. Louis says he has come to inform you that the venue for their battle has already been set. Sylphie says they already know, it's the spirit forest. Yesterday, Claude personally came to report this. Louis is surprised that this fool came here on his own. 
he says that this is despite the fact that the king stressed that it is impossible to meet with an opponent before the day of the competition. As soon as everything is over, he will personally open it to conduct several experiments. Sylphie says, anyway, he'd better explain why they chose the spirit forest. She thinks they already understand what kind of place this is, so why did father still give permission for the battle to be held there? Aisha agrees and says that because of the spiritual activity, the monsters in this forest are much stronger than usual. They can even be compared to monsters from the dungeon. The king himself has decreed that it is forbidden to enter this forest. Louis says he understands what Aisha is talking about. However, the terms of the competition and her destination were suggested by Claude. He decided that the battle would be to hunt monsters in this forest, and the hunter who caught the strongest beast would win. These are very simple rules and there was a reason for choosing the spirit forest. Upon learning of Claude's intentions, the king gave his permission to enter the spirit forest. Sylphie asks what his intentions are, what he's up to. Louis says that the divine beast Fenrir lives in the spirit forest. He is sure that Claude plans to catch him. After capturing the dragon, he set his sights on the divine beast. Maine says that it seems that his father once told him about a divine beast. It seems that such animals were used by the gods. Louis says this is true, and they are also something like guardians of this world. They can be called guardian gods that protect the human race. Maine asks if he really wants to say that Claude decided to capture the divine beast. Louis says that he would not like to think about it, but most likely it is, however, if we are talking about a divine beast then its value will be many times more than a dragon. For Claude, such a word as respect means nothing. Even in the royal family he sees only monetary benefits. Therefore, the only explanation why Claude, who does not even have the strength to defeat an ordinary orc, decided to get into a fight and chose the spirit forest as the place of battle is a divine beast. In other words, money. And since he is targeting the divine beast, it is highly likely that he will lead his squad into the forest, which helped him steal the dragon earlier, and if they already know this, they should capture him. To do this, they will have to use the mine as bait. Vane immediately says that they don't have to worry about this. Louis wants them to enter this forest at the same time as Claude, where they will be given a backpack and a signal balloon. He asks them to be careful not to lose them, besides not to let them be stolen. Maine asks about the backpack and the signal ball. He explains that there are things in the backpack that will help him if the situation starts to deteriorate. To give a signal, it is enough for him to crush the ball. When he does, he will release a bright flash into the sky. As soon as their competition starts, he wants him to follow Claude until he joins up with his group. He asks Maine to try to make sure that he doesn't notice him. Maine confidently replies that he understood him. Louis says that when this squad shows up, if he thinks he can defeat these mercenaries, then let him try to detain them, but still it's better not to get into trouble. He says that he will try to capture them using paste. He says that even if he catches them, let him crush the signal ball, sending them a signal. When they see him, Arudo and the Order of Knights who will be waiting outside will immediately rush to him. He says he understands. Louis says that, however, if he feels that he cannot personally deal with them, or if they capture the divine beast, he does not hesitate to give a signal, regardless of any circumstances. Then Aisha comes up and tells Louis to let them do something to help. Sylphie agrees and says that you can't give all the tasks only to her darling. He says he understands everything, but if they move in a large group, they will most likely be easily discovered by an enemy group, and none of them wants that. He asks if they could wait outside the forest, along with a small detachment of the Order of Knights. Brother Arudo said that he would not be hindered by their strength. Aisha admires his highness. Sylphie says that means they will be under his command, it suits her. Vane says that if they are around, he will definitely be able to defeat them all. Aisha says that as soon as they see the signal fire, they will immediately rush to help. Sylphie says they will definitely protect him. Sylphie turns to her brother and says that she thinks they are in too much of a hurry to capture that squad. Sylphie says that they will even make the divine beast a bait. There is a limit to the absurdity. She suspiciously asks if he will tell them the reason why they need to catch them as soon as possible. Louis says that this morning the squad of knights who were watching the dragon's lair reported that the black dragon flew out of its lair. If they don't find his cub as soon as possible, this country will come to an end. Everyone reacts in horror to this news. Maine is getting ready. Louis says that tomorrow is the decisive day. Once Claude falls into their trap, they can bring back the baby dragon. He turns to Maine and says just to know. He relies on his strength that defeated the Orc King. Maine agrees, but awkwardly asks if he could stop referring to him as a brother. He asks why. He asks to be called just Maine. He laughs and says that he understands. In that case, 
He wants him to just call him Louis. Main agrees again. Louis tells the knights to bring what they were talking about. They bring a bag of coins and some kind of stone. Main is shocked to say that there are so many platinum coins and even a precious stone. Louis asks if he remembers the corpse of the orc king that his sister brought to the castle, his clan bought it. He says that this gem is actually the king's magic stone. It is very valuable, so he decided it was better to give it to him. Main thanks him. The girl in special clothes comes and apologizes for making them wait, and that they are ready. Sylphie says that she still can't believe that tomorrow is the day of the competition. Aisha agrees and says how fast time flies. Louis says that if everyone is already assembled, he suggests starting. He would like to discuss their plan of action as soon as possible. He tells them that a carriage is already waiting for them outside. They should get into it as soon as possible. After they meet with the king, they will be taken to the forest. Nain asks if they are going to have an audience with the king now. Aisha asks if she doesn't have to meet with Hai. Louis says the two of them will go there together. Sylphie says that you shouldn't worry so much, after all, they are now their precious family. They're riding in a carriage. Main is thinking about his family. The baby dragon has been separated from his relatives. He must definitely bring him back. Meanwhile, the collared cub lies in the dungeon next to the robbers. Claude comes up to them and asks how his condition is. He asks if his little dragon has calmed down. They reply that, as he can see, he is now completely obeying his orders. The dragon makes a sound. Claude says that even the dragon is not able to resist the power of the collar. At this time, Louis, Maine, Sylphie and Aisha are walking around the kingdom. Then someone calls Sylphie. She turns around and sees little Ailey. Sylphie asks if she is sure that she can leave the room, because her body. Everyone is looking at her. Ailey replies that she has heard that she is going on a dangerous mission, so she decided to at least accompany her. Naruto says that this is Ailey August, their precious younger sister, who has been in poor health since birth so she has hardly left the castle borders. He says he thinks it would be great if her new older brother told her about his adventures. Maine asks to be allowed to introduce himself. His name is Maina. As soon as he returns from the mission, he will definitely tell her everything. About Lucas, about the people from the city and about his family, he wants to tell her a lot. Haley happily asks if it's really true, then he will wait for his return with even more impatience. She asks him to remember what he promised her. He agrees. At the outpost of the spirit forest, the cabman tells the knights that Lord Roselius's carriage has arrived. They are on their way to the spirit forest. He replies that he understood them, but just in case he asks to be allowed to check. The knight asks Claude if he is alone. He replies that, as he sees it, it is. The knight looks around and shouts that there is nothing special, so let them pass. As they drive away, the driver notices that the cart is full of robbers. One of them complacently says that no one will be able to detect them. A new carriage passes by the outpost. The knight reports that Claude was alone. Just a few minutes ago he passed this gate. He wishes them luck. Arudo asks Maine if he has heard. The only way leading to the spirit forest is through this outpost. There is no other way. If Claude somehow managed to bring mercenaries with him, it means that they have an ability that deceives people's eyes. He says that even though the Order of Knights is watching the forest, Maine should not lose his vigilance. Maine is listening. Mina is handed a backpack and asked to take it. There is a signal ball in it in case of an emergency, so he asks not to lose it until the end of the competition. Maine examines the backpack and says, this is what it looks like. It seems to him that time has stopped now. The knight immediately tells him that Claude is currently resting in a distant tent. The three of them will be guarding him, so he should rest properly until morning. He's listening. He is told that this fire has the ability to repel any magic, so he does not have to worry that the monsters living in the forest will be able to approach the camp. Maine thanks the knight, who asks him to have a good rest. Maine looks and says, wow, there's a tent, there's even a bed here. He sits down on the blood and thinks that, however, it's too early to go to bed. We need to check if Claude is up to something. It uses presence scanning. He examines everything and thinks that his ability, of course, is not capable of scanning the entire forest. But he finds Claude's tent and realizes that he is still alone inside. He looks at the thick of the forest and thinks that there are so many strong monsters in the forest. But he does not feel people among them. These mercenaries of Claude, whether they really disappeared into the forest. He finds some kind of light. His scan barely reaches there. He thinks how strange it is. He feels such a strong aura. Who could it be? He sees someone's face and is horrified. He wonders what it was. Is it really a divine beast? His heart is beating hard. Even though he had no intention of opposing him, why does he have such a murderous aura? Claude comes in and says he's here after all. He asks how about getting to know each other better in this cramped tent. 
He says that despite the fact that he came to him on purpose, not only did he not greet him, he also dared to say his name without respect. Maid asks why he came here. He thinks it's strange. Shouldn't the soldiers outside have kept him out? How and why he got into his room? Claude says that he came to give him one last chance, instead of shamefully losing to him. It's better to let him give up. Main declares that he is not going to give up just like that. Then Claude kicks him hard in the stomach. Claude takes the sword and says that in this case, when he loses, he will not only make Sylphie his own, but also the girl who bears the title of the sacred bow. Main says that even if he somehow wins, he doesn't think they would want to stay with a man like him. Claude is standing with a spear pointed at him. A guard comes and says that he heard some noise, is everything all right there? Main shouts at him. Claude says there's no problem, so let him stand and watch. The guard obeys and says that he will do as Claude orders. Main doesn't understand what's going on at all. Claude calls Main a commoner again and says that no one dares to go against him. Main wonders why this is happening. He reads his stats. He wields a two-handed spear on average and the art of eloquence. He reads the characteristics of a guard who is a knight of the kingdom of August. His condition is enslaved. Main sees this and doesn't understand what it means. He tries to cut out this item, but nothing is removed. Then he realizes that the cut does not work. Claude kicks and presses his foot harder, which makes Main moan in pain. Claude tells him with a sly smile that this is his last chance. Claude turns to the knight and says that if this commoner refuses to surrender, he will have to kill himself immediately. The guard obeys and says that he will do as Claude wants. Main keeps shouting at the guard not to obey him, calling his name. However, Derek does not react to his words in any way. Claude asks Main what he will do now, because now his life is in his hands, of course. The two who stand guard also obey him. Main begins to be horrified and says that this cannot be. He understands that if he does not surrender, these knights will die. Claude chuckles. Then he laughs loudly and maliciously, saying what a beautiful expression he has on his face. He shouts that he wants him to show it to him more than once. Claude gets up and tells him that he cannot give up, since he does not want to. If he is so stubborn, he will make Sylphie and the Holy Bow his toys right in front of his eyes. He leaves and tells him to show that expression again. Claude comes out of the tent and talks scattering. After he dispels the enslavement, the guard wakes up and asks why he was in Mr. Main's room at all. Main stands up. Main comes over and asks if he's feeling okay. He asks why he is standing with a drawn sword, what happened in the first place. The guard examines himself, Main looks at his characteristics. He sees that the enslavement has disappeared. He does not understand what Claude has done to him. He reflects that it doesn't look like an ability. If he uses it on a dragon or a divine beast, then things could be much worse than they could have imagined. The next morning, a small animal is actively running in the forest on its small paws. A huge snake crawls behind her, sticking out its tongue and enveloping the trees with its body. She greedily opens her mouth to bite, but the beast gives his guys a sign that they need to act now. A lot of other small animals stick out and bite the snake from different sides. He says it's great. The snake continues to writhe and hiss, the main beast screams that it remains only to finish it off. The animal flies away from the snake, and the snake falls lifelessly with a big crash to the ground with its mouth open. The animals shout to the main one that it was something as cool. They ask him what kind of reception it was. The dog proudly raises his head and says that he learned this trick from his mother. All the other three admire and shout that they want it too. This smug one suggests it's better to take their loot home. Then they'll all have breakfast together. They notice something, turn their heads and ask what it is. Then a big beast appears, which exudes fire from itself. They're shouting that mommy's here. They immediately run away to their mother and say that they hunted here and ask for praise. One of the animals does not understand why mommy came here, she never leaves their abode. Small children approach the beast, examine it and notice something amiss. The beast's eyes are filled with bloodlust and evil. Here one shouts to the others to stand and informs them that it is not their mother. Little wolves sniff it and don't understand what's wrong. Here, the same robbers put collars on small animals. The girl who turned into their mother says that's all. The divine beast Fenrir is practically in their hands. That little one is shouting to the guys with great concern. The fake divine beast says, what a disappointment, because even the cubs of the divine beast were deceived by her charm ability. The little wolf cub realizes that it's not their mother. He shouts to the other guys to get away from her immediately, but those already in collars turn and look at him soullessly. The robber says that one of them does not seem to be affected by her charms, she is even a little surprised. The little wolf cub screams who she is, what she did to his brothers and sisters. He approaches them fiercely and viciously. The beastman replies that charm is an ability that shows the enemy what is closest to his heart. It is almost impossible to distinguish a fake from reality. 
A silhouette appears behind the wolf cub and asks if it was said about him that he has the right magical power. The little wolf turns in a panic, but another robber catches him and says that you shouldn't kick like that. He presses the cub's body to the ground and tells them not to worry so much, they will sell him along with his siblings. The little wolf begins to howl. The main beastman tells Katz that they don't have any more collars left, it's better to soak him as soon as possible. Katz who tells his boss that this is such a waste. He had heard that divine beasts were able to communicate telepathically. If his mother was wandering in this forest somewhere and he called her, then there would be no end of problems. Katsu pulls out his knife and says that it will really be unpleasant. With his other hand he holds the cub's head and says that there is nothing to be done. He says goodbye to the doggy and swings his knife. There is some kind of scream throughout the forest that Maine notices him. Maine wonders how to understand this, did five people suddenly appear in the forest just now? He immediately thinks of Claude's henchmen. It feels like they've teleported here. He stands on a tree branch and watches Claude. The competition has just begun. Claude is really looking for magical beasts now. He has not seen him mess with mercenaries. Claude keeps looking around. Maine wonders how he could even do this if they are so far away. How he wants to go and find out who it is. He knows that there are a lot of people watching the forest now. And if they were able to enter the forest unnoticed, then it won't be difficult for them to get out of here. Maine looks at Claude and thinks, if that's the case, then maybe he should continue to pursue Claude. Suddenly Claude grins. Maine gets scared and remembers the situation with Derek Brown. Claude stands and reflects that he knows everything. The commoner is hiding somewhere and watching him. Because yesterday, thanks to submission, he learned absolutely all the information about their plan. He says to himself, let him keep an eye on him. It's not for nothing that he's deliberately leading him by the nose. Some kind of hairy monster is visible from afar. He thinks that it would probably be a good solution to subdue this macaque and order her to take him as far away from the lair of the divine beast as possible, so that this fool would move away from his real goal. He raises his palm and thinks that it would be just fine if they continued to dance to his tune, not knowing that he had exposed their plan. Maine starts jumping trees and thinks that there is no doubt that Claude already knows about their plan. All this time, he was deliberately leading him away from his henchmen, a way that would allow them to enter the forest unnoticed. Maybe they used the same displacement stone as in the dungeon, or it is the ability to completely disappear presence, or maybe a special magic of space and time. If they were capable of such a thing, then he needed to catch them as soon as possible. He jumps onto a branch and pushes off from it. He is still worried about what he felt recently, those four who were next to the five mercenaries. He sees up ahead that they are still there. He uses the complete disappearance of presence and lands on one branch. He's watching intently. He sees people, after all, they manage to get into the forest. Katsu stands and says that they are done with the work, so it's time for them to get out of this forest. Others agree with him. The girl calls the wolves after her and tells them to follow her. Main thinks that these puppies are Fenriri. He uses his skill and sees that they are all enslaved. He realizes that, just like yesterday's guard, he is convinced that these people are definitely Claude's accomplices. He sees a little wolf cub on the ground, which was not affected by the force. He thinks that Fenrir is injured. He thinks what a nightmare it is, did those mercenaries do it? He uses magic while standing on a branch. If he hurries, he will still have time to save him. He will cut out his enhanced regeneration and insert this baby. He begs himself to make it. At this time, the girl picks up the animals and says what pathetic animals they are. They are even easier to catch than a dragon. It's a disappointment to her. Katsu says it's still a shame that one had to be killed. Such a waste of money. Then they turn around and see that the kid is standing on his feet. They scream, pointing at the baby. Katsu screams that this can't be happening. Why is he still alive? He claims that he definitely dealt him a fatal blow. It's just incredible for him. He says it with his mouth open. The little Fenrir starts howling even more. One asks if he is really trying to summon his mother. Katsu swears and tells him not to even try to underestimate him. He abruptly approaches the animal and says he will deprive it of its head. Then Mainu immediately comes out and reflects Katsu's blow. Katsu looks in horror and does not understand. Main in anger uses a flash of the magic eye that Katsu flies away from him. He falls down groaning. Everyone is worried. Main asks Fenrir if he's okay. He barks. Main smiles, realizing that he is healthy. Main sees that they are all murderers, and they all have a complete lack of presence but each has different skills. Main thinks, are the killers really? They all have the ability of complete absence of presence, and what kind of charm is this? He thinks it's still strange. He definitely felt the presence of five people, but there are four of them here. Maybe one has already left the forest. Then a huge hand grabs Main and asks if he can get so close to them. Who is he anyway? 
Mayne understands that this is a disaster, because he was hiding with the help of complete absence. The beastman says he's the one Claude told them about, Mayne, if he's not mistaken. Katsu asks the boss to let him kill this boy, because those who notice them should be killed immediately, such things. The little wolf cub behind starts barking, Mayne yells at him to run. Katsu prepares a weapon and says that he is playing the hero when his head is about to be blown off. Suddenly, the entire silhouette of Katsu disappears, but blood splashes all over. Everyone freezes in horror and does not understand what is the matter. Then the divine beast comes, calls them scoundrels and asks what they have done to his children. The bandits look at Katsu's remaining arm and head and are horrified. One says it can't be. One gets angry and shouts how she dared to kill Katz. They promise that they will kill the beast. The divine beast is confidently walking towards them. The main boss shouts that it is impossible to attack, because this is an enemy that they cannot defeat by attacking directly. They must use the complete absence of presence, and then put a collar on her. The divine beast says that he does not think that something like this is capable of fooling her. Immediately the power of the beast strikes two of those who are about to attack them. The beastman calls them stupid. Main freezes with the realization that three people have just died in front of his eyes. When he became an adventurer, he thought he would be ready for this, but how can you be ready for this? The boss shouts at Karaka to order these puppies to protect them. They use them as a shield and run away into the forest. Karaka says that she understood him and that it was a good idea. He tells the wolves to protect them with their boss at the cost of their own lives, so that they can never be hurt. Main understands that these puppies are under control just like the guard from yesterday. If he tries to attack the mercenaries, the puppies will protect them and die. Karaka turns to the divine beast and says that they are taking these children with them. The beast asks if they really think they can escape. Karaka says that if she tries to attack them, her children will definitely die. Here the little wolf cub shouts to his mother that it is not necessary, and that these people can somehow order them to obey them. Suddenly, a dark force envelops everyone, including Mane. The divine beast calls them pathetic fools, she will make them regret their own actions. Mane starts talking, asking not to do it. He understands that she is preparing a crazy wave for them. Karika tells the kids to die, but to stop this blow. The divine beast doesn't understand what her little ones are doing, they have to dodge. Then a little wolf cub comes out, pushes his brothers and sisters away, realizing that he saved everyone, but he gets hit. Here the wolf cub protects the mine, covering it with his whole body and falls under the insane wave of the divine beast. Bane says that he will not allow anyone to be deprived of their family, he will never allow it. Mine uses an iron wall, increasing strength, strengthening the body, strengthening protection. He can barely stand, but he understands, he still can't hold on. The little wolf cub looks admiringly, Mane can barely stand on his feet. The divine beast says that it is useless and that it will destroy him. Here the divine beast sees the special magic of space and time. Mane manages to resist, the blow passes him by. Mane is breathing heavily and is relieved to say that he got through. The divine beast does not understand how this is even possible. The beast understands that this human youth was able to withstand the power of God, he calls him special. The god said that a special one was born among people. The little wolf cub whines and rubs against Mane's leg. Mane says he's glad he's okay. The divine beast thinks, is this young man really special? Mane turns around and wonders what happened to the other puppies. They hear screams that this is such a nightmare, so many trees have died in this forest. Mane starts to worry if these puppies are dead, it can't be. The divine beast turns to him and tells him not to worry because they are alive. They had escaped with those people, if she had intervened, she would most likely have only harmed them, so she did not pursue them. Bane resolutely says that he will go look for them. The divine beast tells him that he is a rather unusual person. He is ready to put his life in danger for the sake of her children. She had seen people a few centuries ago, but none of them looked like him. The little wolf starts barking. The mother says awkwardly that she understood, you shouldn't be so angry at her. The divine beast bows to Mane and thanks him for saving his child. Mane asks in a panic to stop, the divine beast should not bow its head. He asks for forgiveness, on the contrary. He says that in order to protect himself, he had to redirect the attack in the other direction. Because of this, her forest was damaged. A little wolf cub climbs on a man's head and starts barking even more. The divine beast quotes what the puppy says, that it's not his fault, it's mommy messed up, so he tells Mane to cheer up. Mane smiles and thanks the wolf cub, who sighs contentedly. The divine beast asks him how these robbers managed to tame her children. He says that it was not domestication, submission, if he is not mistaken. 
The mother says that the baby says that these scoundrels put something similar to collars on her children. Main says that if you remember, yesterday that soldier also had some kind of sacred collar around his neck. Mother thinks that a collar capable of subjugating a divine beast. People would not have the strength to create such a thing. Main says that he has stopped feeling the presence of those mercenaries. He can only hope that they have not left the forest yet. The mother says that they are still in the forest and that they are staying nearby. Main asks how she knows. She replies that things like complete absence of presence are useless against divine beasts. However, the kids have not yet awakened this power in themselves. The problem is that they use her children as a human shield. Because of her striking power, she will not be able to save them without harming them. She wonders what to do. Main reflects that it is impossible to cut out subordination and it is impossible to attack them. It seems that he simply has no choice. Main says that he will try to save her children. In order to protect the lives of these babies, he will have to steal the abilities of their kidnappers. The mother says that if he has a plan, she will listen to him. It is rather weak on her part, but she has no choice but to rely on him and the baby says that she wants to help him save his brothers and sisters. Main is surprised. His mother asks if he will take him with him. Main asks him if he really wants to go with him and save them. Then he counts on him. He introduces himself and says that they will be acquainted. He says he's glad to meet you. There is silence, and Main looks at him in surprise. The little wolf cub asks what is it. Main screams what he says, before that he only barked, so he also understands what Main is saying. His mother says that you shouldn't be so surprised, he just gave him the blessing of a divine beast. He asks again. The mother says that this is gratitude for the fact that he saved her child. Now he has the status of a friend of the divine beast, in human terms. Main is surprised and realizes that something has been added. He asks if he can be friends with the divine beast, if she is sure that this is possible. The mother approaches and says that she will take them to the mercenaries, so let them sit on her back. Main wonders how it feels to sit on the back of a divine beast. Later, they ride through the forest. Main is surprised at how fast they are racing. His mother tells him that they are right under this slope. She asks if he can jump off, he says no problem. The divine beast stops and shouts that she is counting on him, let him save her children. They fly in the air and promise her this. He lands and thinks he doesn't feel the presence of the mercenaries, but he can sense the presence of the puppies. He turns around and sees two girls. He is surprised as soon as he sees them. They are Silphy and Aisha. He asks what they are doing here. Main asks them why, shouldn't they have been waiting outside the forest? A little wolf cub shouts to him that there is only one person in front of him. They are trying to deceive him. He screams that it's a fake. It's Karika who sticks a knife in his stomach and says that she already thought that that mom had come, she didn't expect it to be him. The little wolf cub screams excitedly. Karika wishes him pleasant dreams, and she takes the wolf cub for herself. Here, Main reaches out and uses the impulse of the magic eye. Karika immediately falls unconscious, the little wolf asks if he is okay. However, Aisha is standing next to them. Main replies to the wolf cub that she is fine. Thanks to him, he was able to dodge the fatal blow. He sees that Aisha is disappearing. He understands, so this is the very charm ability. The little wolf cub says that his brothers were also deceived by her. Main reflects that it is now clear that this ability is really dangerous. It is better to cut out this ability from her while she is out. The little wolf cub in a panic shouts to the mind that another one is approaching from behind. He must dodge the blow. Main turns around, but before he can move, he is slammed into a tree and stands with his palm on his cheek, which was hit. He thinks, how is it? He didn't even feel a breath of wind. The little wolf cub shouts to Mainu to duck, he manages. The wood is scratching. He wonders if he's right in front of him. He uses the impulse of the magic eye, but immediately gets hit in the face that blood is flowing from his nose. He does not understand why this is so. He gets up and still doesn't understand. Suddenly something flew in his direction. What is it? He sees the silhouette of a puppy. He thinks, is it really the magic eye of that puppy? Did he react so quickly to his ability? The beastman, surrounded by three Fenrir, asks Main if he was trying to attack him now. These puppies can completely protect him even from those attacks that are visible, and despite the fact that they are still puppies, they are such divine beasts. The little wolf cub shouts to Main, who tells him not to worry. He understands that there is nothing he can do now, it turns out that he has no way out. Mine uses a full scan for the enemy. Leo says he has a truly impressive healing ability. He reaches out and tries to cut out, but immediately becomes the one everyone is attacking. He falls, hits his back. Main is horrified, they even reacted to the cut. A little wolf cub runs to him and tells him that he should not attack. Leo says he's a fool, he understands what will happen if he tries to attack him. Three Fenrir are standing next to him. 
Mane realizes that he cannot attack and cannot use the cut. Leo says that since he has seen them, he must die. Leo disappears. Mane thinks that now he has even more problems due to his complete lack of presence. He begins to think that Aruto's older brother would certainly have handled him easily. He remembers his words that in a battle against an enemy, the main thing is to be able to learn how to read his stream. If he cannot, then he must create it himself. The little wolf cub shouts to the mine that it is right behind him, he must dodge. Main follows and manages to leave. He thinks that this can't be. Does this kid see him? He remembers that just recently he also warned him. Leo is surprised that he dodged, was he really lucky? The little wolf cub screams to Mainu that he is attacking from above. Mainu uses sleep for him. He begins to resist this action. Leo loses his guard for a while. Main thinks he was able to resist, but still it affected him. Main asks the cub if he can see him. He replies that he can, for him it literally glows red. He asks if Main can't see him. Main says that he is invisible to him. The little wolf says that in this case, he will tell him where he is. Leo thinks, does this boy really see him? But it's impossible. The little wolf cub is watching intently and shouts to Mainu that he is ahead right above him. Leo tries to kick, but Main manages to dodge and run away from him into the forest. The little wolf cub asks the mine what to do, since they can't attack him, what should they do? Main remembers her father's words that today they will learn to hunt again. Dine asked if he saw those rabbits, he needed to catch them alive. He then asked his father how he could catch them if he had left his traps at home today. His father then replied that this would be his lesson. If he looks around, he can see that there are many things in the forest that can be used to create traps. Returning to the present, Main grabs the rope and uses the carving skill. The little wolf cub shouts to the Main that he is approaching from the left side. Main asks how it turns out that it is highlighted in red for him. He replies that he has no idea, he is approaching from the front. Someone tells him that divine beasts are able to see magic power. Main wonders if he's really hearing this in his head. The little wolf cub says it's mom. The divine beast says that everything that exists in this world has its own magical power, not only people, but also stones with plants. When they use their abilities, they release it. So they, the divine beasts, are able to see through things like the complete absence of presence. The mother says that she is surprised that the baby has already managed to learn to see magical power. The little wolf cub says that up to this moment he could not see this light, most likely. This power was awakened when those fools almost killed him, because after Maine saved him, he could already see this light. The mother asks Maine if he has the ability to influence the growth of the level. Maine tells the mother mentally that it looks like as long as her baby is with him, his level is growing well. She says it's really very interesting. Maine connects two ropes and pulls her up the trees. The little wolf cub shouts to the mine that the enemy is ahead, and that he is incredibly fast. Maine walks away from the blow, still pulling on the rope. For now, he will continue to play catch up with him, and then he will create a stream himself. Leo says that this boy keeps running back and forth, but he already knows all his tricks. He lists his abilities for himself, sleep, healing, complete absence of presence. He sees these vines, apparently if he touches them, he will be able to find out his location. After all, he's just a kid, so now he's going to show him the difference in experience. The little wolf cub shouts to Mainu that he is already attacking. Main is alarmed. He shouts that he is here right in front of him. Main holds out his hand again. Leo says that sleep won't work on him, and Main uses a speed reduction. Leo does not understand what it is, the body has become so heavy. He looks around and sees a vine above them in the lattice. The mine uses a cut. After that, Leo gets trapped, he's in the net. He is outraged why Fenrir's puppies don't help him. Main says it's useless to ask them, because this trap is not an attack that can inflict wounds on him. Leo screams in anger. Main remembers the past, he also tried to catch rabbits, but he couldn't. He tells his father that it's hard. His father then told him that if he did not forget today's lesson, then next time he would definitely succeed. He asked him to try his best. The divine beast tells Main that he was able to catch them without harming them, so he's not bad. Leo is still in the net and Karika is tied up next to him. Main tells his mother that this baby helped him. He definitely couldn't have done it alone. She tells her baby that he has grown up enough. He happily says that it's all thanks to the mine. The divine beast comes up and asks why they don't take the collars off her babies now. Karika asks with a grin, but she herself cannot. She says they're not stupid, they know that if they take it off, she'll kill them right away. The divine tells her not to even doubt, Karika says that therefore, for the sake of their own survival, they will use her babies as they want. Karika turns to them and orders them to kill this kid as harshly as possible. The little wolf cub is wary. The mother starts to get angry. Karika asks what she will do now. The little wolf cub tells his siblings to stop. 
Haruka says that if she lets them escape, then she will cancel the order. Main comes out and asks her to stop. Haruka says what he needs, so let him get away from the cubs. Main reaches out to one of the cubs and asks sadly why they are so easily disposing of someone else's life. Haruka asks what he wants to do, because only they are able to remove these collars. Leo is watching them. Main removes the collar from the wolf, everyone is surprised. Leo and Karika are horrified, they don't understand how he managed to take it off. Leo shouts at Karika to stop the boy, otherwise they will lose their shields. Karika gives the order to kill this boy quickly. Main says he was able to remove the collars from everyone. The little wolf cub asks his siblings if they are okay. The mother thanks Main for saving her children. Main says with a smile that it's not worth the thanks. She turns to the robbers and says that now all they have to do is accept divine punishment. The mother uses her power and kills criminals to the nines. The divine beast apologizes to the mine, but those who choose to go against heaven must be punished. And also, as a servant of God, she wants to hear from him why he can use the ability of the demon king. Main explains everything, she says, which means that he has not only a full scan, but also a cut and paste. Main says he stole the royal compulsion from the orc king. She says she understands that, but what about the ability with which he took off the collars? He says that the orc king also possessed special magic of space and time. To be honest, he was not completely sure that he would succeed. When he used this ability before, a black hole opened up, and the orc king, without even creating it, could move through space. He says that it flashed through his mind that he was really using space and time. Then he decided that this way he could remove the collars. He holds the collar and says that he thought that if he could use this ability on them, he would move them to another place. The divine beast says that because its power is too great, it carries danger. It is not the kind of power that a human should possess. Main looks at her sadly. However, if she was given to him by God, therefore, henceforth, as a servant of God, she will protect him. Main repeats in surprise, is the divine beast going to protect him? He thanks her. She remembers and asks why he came to this forest in the first place. He tells about the dragon and his child. The mother asks in horror if the man stole the baby dragon. Bane says that, most likely, it was done by mercenaries who used these collars. The little wolf cub comes up to the mine and says that, it turns out, because mom killed those scoundrels, he now has problems. The mother turns away from them awkwardly. Main speaks in a panic, that it's nothing like that. Besides, they wanted to kill them themselves, so she just didn't have a choice. As long as he had this collar, everything was fine. He asks if this is exactly the case. In any case, he will help him. Main and his mother are surprised. The little wolf cub says that mine saved them, so he wants to save him too. He is invited to go save the baby dragon together. The mother asks Main if he will take him with him. He asks if it is possible. It may be dangerous for him to go with him. She says that her baby is able to feel the magical energy of the dragon, and also understands his speech perfectly. She tells him that he will be useful to him, besides, she thinks that he liked him. Main thinks he really liked it. Main says that he will feel much more confident if he goes with him, they will go to save the dragon together. The little wolf cub barks happily. The mother tells Main that she trusts him with her baby. The other brothers and sisters leave, say goodbye and tell their brother to try. They all say goodbye. Main is standing at the cliff, holding a ball in his hand. He says that he needs to return to the castle as soon as possible and report a lot. The balloon explodes, fireworks begin in the sky. Main looks and screams, how cool is it, what is it? They stand like that for a while. And then Main says why don't someone stop hiding and come out already? Claude comes out of the forest and tells Main that he has given a signal sign which means that he has decided to admit defeat. Main holds out the collar and asks him if he knows what it is. He evasively replies that he has no idea. Main says that he took this thing from the mercenaries who were in the forest. They said it belonged to him. Claude swears at them in his mind and asks Main what happened to them. Main replies that they are all dead. He is going to take this thing to the king and tell him about all his atrocities. Claude says that's how it is, then even he won't be able to get away from punishment. Main asks if he really admits that it belongs to him. Claude says it's really his, however. Then suddenly the collar is put on the neck of the mine. Claude says that he will be punished instead. He will have to admit all his sins in his place. This is an order. Let the nobility obey, as befits a commoner. Main easily removes the collar and says that such a thing will not work on him. Claude gets scared. He thinks it's absurd how he managed to take off his collar. Claude screams that he is a pathetic commoner. He orders the forest monster to crush this little thing. The monster comes out of the forest directly to the lane. Main thinks, is it really submission? He does not have time to remove. Then Sylphie comes out and robs the monster of his arm with his sword. Main happily shouts her name. 
Claude thinks that since Sylphie came here, it means he has a great chance. He picks up the collar. He shouts that S. Ilfi now belongs to him, after which he pulls the collar towards her. But then Aisha already prevents him with her arrow. Main rejoices even more, Sylphie says, which is to be expected from Saint Luke. Aisha stands aside and looks at them. Claude is left alone without the beast and without his powers. A sword is held to his neck, he is trembling and squeaking in fright. Sylphie holds out her huge sword at him and says she will not forgive him for raising his hand against her darling, calling him pathetic Claude. King Farron stood in the hall of the castle, holding a large ring in his hands. It was a collar of submission. The king said it was a forbidden magic tool. Reflecting, he added that such a thing could not only capture a divine beast. Main said that Claude had as many as six such collars. The king assumed that Claude was planning to use the collar to kill. The king said that now Claude would definitely not be able to get away. He praised Main and told him to have a good rest. Main happily agreed. Aruto told Main that everyone had already waited for them, and led them through the corridors of the castle. The king remained, looking at the ring in his hands, puzzled. Then the king called out to Main and said he wanted to ask him something. The king asked if the assassins had put these collars on the divine beasts. The king said that the collars can only be removed by those who put them on. He asked Main who had managed to take them off and how. Main hesitated. The king replied that, apparently, it was not worth finding out about it, and told the Main to forget what he had said. After that, he turned around and left. The king went down to the dungeon. The king turned to the guard and asked if he had found out anything. Claude was hanging at the end of the dungeon, wounded and chained to the wall. The guard answered the king's question in the negative. He said that Claude was clearly not going to blurt out his secrets, even though it hurt him. There was an exclamation from the side. It was Claude's father, Roselia. He asked the king how this could be understood. Kral replied to Roselia that his son, Claude, was hiding a baby dragon. My father turned to Claude. He asked if he could imagine what the dragon would do to humans if he found out that they had stolen his child. Roselia shouted, Is Claude planning to destroy the whole country? Claude told his father to disappear. Claude said that he was doing all this only for the sake of the Roselia clan, although his father should have done all this. After that, Claude turned to the king. He said that if the king wanted the baby dragon so badly, he should give him Sylvia. Claude's father was amazed. Claude said that commoners should know their place. He told the king that the only one who was ideally suited to be his daughter's partner was him. The king replied to Claude that he understood his hatred. However, like Maine, he was born a poor peasant, but became king thanks to his ability. Claude replied to the king that the dirty blood of commoners flows in his veins, which is why he must understand that he cannot allow the blood of his kind to be stained even more. Roselia angrily shouted at his son, asking what he was talking about. The king calmly replied to Roselia that his son was right about everything. King Farron told Claude that in order to become king, he had to get his hands dirty more than once, so he would not hesitate to use it on him. He showed Claude the submission collar he was holding in his hands. The king added that after Claude confessed everything, he would most likely make him a minion. Claude was terrified that the king owned the collar of submission. Claude shouted in horror that this couldn't be happening. He said the king couldn't use it. If he uses the collar, he will become a criminal. Claude shouted that the king had no right to use it. The king asked his prisoner if he really thought he couldn't use the collar. Claude shouted to his father to stop the king. He continued to scream in fear for him to save his son and begged the king not to do it. At this time, Main and Naruto approached Sylvia. She was clutching a fluffy wolf cub in her arms. The animal tried to escape from the princess's embrace and asked Main to save it. Aisha was standing to the side next to Sylvia. She looked at the wolf cub with delight and asked the princess to let her cuddle him too. The little wolf cub screamed that the princess was embarrassing him and asked her to let him go. Aruto asked if this was the divine beast. Main said with emotion that it looked like the wolf cub liked the princess. Behind them stood a girl with glasses Louie. She said that she would also like to touch the animal. Aruto was surprised that the little wolf cub was strong. Main replied that he was very strong for such a baby. Aruto replied that in that case he would like to fight the beast. But Main told him not to think about doing it. A small wolf cub barked and rushed at Main and grabbed his face. Aisha shouted that it wasn't fair, because she hadn't even touched him. Sylphie shouted to the divine beast that she needed to feel its furiness a little more. Main told the girls to let the baby rest anyway. After all, he had recently been in battle. A little wolf cub was sitting on Mina's head and grumbling that people were very strange. Main told Sylphie and Aisha that the real ones were very different after all. The girls asked him again. Main said that in the forest, when one of the mercenaries used the ability of charm, clones of girls appeared in front of him. 
They looked very similar to them, but their aura was completely different. Aisha was surprised that the charm created the princess and her. Vane replied that he was really confused at the time. Fortunately, the little wolf cub told him that it wasn't Sylphie and Aisha and thus saved him. Aisha said that she had heard about this ability. Sylphie said that if she is not mistaken, then the one who uses this ability sees in front of him the most important thing for him. Aisha was surprised to say that they were the most important thing in Main Kun's life. The young man continued. He said that the day the two of them came and rescued him in Lucas's forest, he realized that he could really trust them. So today he also knew that they would definitely come to his aid. At this time, the guard entered the door. He apologized for interrupting those present during the rest and asked everyone to go to his majesty. Main asked if they had found out the location of the baby dragon. Main and the wolf cub, Arudo and the girls came to the castle. The king apologized for forcing them to come. Sylphie asked the king if they had really managed to find out where the baby dragon was. The king replied that Claude had told everything himself. Claude in the dungeon said that the dragon sucker was in Adora and begged the king not to use the collar. Arudo said that Adora is a dungeon city. It will take at least half a day to get there from the castle on horseback. Apparently, they have no choice but to go there immediately, before the dragon notices the loss. The little wolf cub on Miles' head screamed in fright. He said that things were bad and that the dragon was heading to Adora. The dragon found out that his child had been kidnapped by humans. The divine beast assumed that the dragon would already be in the city before sunset. Maine shouted that it was almost evening and they would not make it in time. The little wolf cub told Maine to calm down. If he uses the magic of space and time, he will definitely make it in time. The animal told Maine that by going on the road alone, he would be able to prevent everything. The divine beast said that it was up to him to save Maine Adora or not. Main frowned and clenched his fists. He said that a message had arrived from Ms. Feng Rur. The dragon was already on its way. The king was surprised that the message was from a divine beast. He said it was telepathy. Main agreed. He said that, apparently, the dragon would arrive in Adora before sunset. Everyone exclaimed in surprise. Main thought that there was too little time left before sunset, and they would not be able to reach Adora in time. It was simply impossible. He asked himself if this was the end. At that moment, Maine exclaimed that he could make it. He said that if he used his ability, he could save Adora and he would go there right away. The young man thought that he had no reason to hesitate. The king asked how Maine wanted to do this. If he wasn't mistaken, then with his ability, mine definitely wouldn't be able to do it. Sylphie and Aisha told Maine if he would tell them the secret of his ability. They said they had been ready to listen to him for a long time. The girl said that if he thinks that now is the best time to tell them, they will accept everything as it is. No matter what happens, they will always be there for him. Main Kun thanked them. He replied that in order to save the people living in Adora, and so that they could trust him, he would tell them all about his ability. The divine beast asked Main what he was thinking at all, because there was less than an hour left before sunset. There is no time and no point in telling everyone about his ability. The beast said that even if Main told them, they would only be scared of him. Now he has to go to Adora immediately. There's an hour left. King Farron told Main that he must have had reasons why he had to keep quiet about his ability. He asked if the young man was sure that he wanted to tell everything now. You shouldn't force yourself. Main was at a loss. The reason he hid his ability was because he thought that even if he told them, they would only be scared of him. But still he made up his mind. Main said that during his lifetime, his father often said that you need to trust your family, that the bonds you can rely on are truly priceless. Main asked if they could trust him wholeheartedly if he hid his power from them. He believes that such trust is unacceptable. He hates the thought of having to leave the king's question unanswered. Only the owner of the collar itself can eventually remove it. However, the one who took them off the cubs of the divine beast was Main himself. The young man said that he had to use the ability of the orc king. Everyone was very surprised by this news. Main continued by saying that he received two abilities from God, cut and paste and full scan. By combining these two abilities, he discovered that in this way they give incredible power. The king asked in surprise. Main Kun continued to talk. He said that if you use a full scan on people, things, and even monsters, all the information about them appears before his eyes. The full scan includes name, gender, age, race, profession, and abilities. By opening these abilities with the help of cut, he can insert them into himself and thus they become his abilities. Everyone was amazed. No one could understand how this was possible. Aisha screamed that this couldn't be happening. The girls realized that at that moment their hubby had stolen the abilities of the Orc King. The king replied that it was unthinkable. If that's really the case, then it's hard to even imagine how strong this ability is. Main Kun continued to tell the story. He said that the Orc King had another interesting ability. 
With it, you can move from one place to another in an instant. The king replied that Mayne's ability was very unusual. However, you can definitely rely on her. His wife giggled and confirmed it. Everyone was amicably delighted with Mayne's abilities. Everyone wanted to go rescue Adora together. If there is a mine with them, then it's like the strength of a hundred people. Aruto stood angrily to the side. He asked Mayne if he would give in to the battle with him. Aruto said that he had asked Mayne and demanded an answer from him. If Mayne had stolen his ability, he would have definitely won. Aruto didn't understand why Mayne didn't do that. Mayne replied that ability is almost the same as life. That's what they say when you get abilities. Up to this point, Mayne had only stolen human abilities twice. The first time it happened was on the day of his coming of age, when the wagon in which he was riding was attacked by robbers. They wanted to kill everyone who was there. The second time occurred when Mayne joined the guild. He stole an ability from an adventurer who wanted to kill his own comrades. Aisha assumed it was Reru-san. Mayne said that there are people in this world who can easily take someone's life, so he decided for himself that he would use his power only to save lives against those who want to take someone's life. He will do this to protect his family. Therefore, at that time, he used all his strength. No matter how much he fights with Aruto, he will not take away his ability in any case. Aruto said it was a mine he knew. He apologized for suspecting Mayne. He turned to the king and said that he would go to Adora with them. The king agreed. The king said that there was an hour left before sunset, so he asked to use all his strength to save Adora and the baby dragon. Louis said she would go too. Mayne explained that he was about to open a portal connecting the castle and Adora. As soon as the portal opens, everyone needs to jump in. Mayne swiped his hand and opened a large dark portal. He told the others that everything was fine and they could go. Aisha and Sylvie looked at the portal in fright. They were afraid to go in there. Aruto asked to enter first. He told Sylphie that if she was scared, it was better to stay in the castle. The king turned to Mayne and the Divine Beast. He asked them to save Adora and everyone in it. They confidently confirmed that they would be able to do this. The portal closed, the hall was empty. The king said that everyone had disappeared and told the guys to try their best. The heroes who arrived stood inside a large arena surrounded by a stone wall with columns. Aruto asked if this was the entrance to the dungeon. In the middle of the arena, a large crystal hung in the air. Aisha said it was a teleportation stone. Mayne replied to her that it was the power of the dungeon. Mayne said that he had brought them here on purpose so that it would seem as if they had been transported using a teleportation stone. The little wolf cub shouted to Mayne and pointed to a huge tower in the distance. The animal said that he could feel the magnetic energy of the baby dragon from there, and that he was on top of that thing. Apparently, the dragon is in that tower. Mayne shouted that as soon as they rescued him, they would need to take him outside of Adora. There were several people standing outside the tower doors. One of them, who was sitting next to the bottles of alcohol, turned to the other, Lord Lidor, and asked how long they would have to stay in this place. The other guy sitting on the stairs agreed. He grumbled that he was already tired of looking after the cub and asked why Claude hadn't returned yet. There was a baby dragon in the middle of the room they were sitting in. He was wearing a collar of submission. The one standing at the door said that it was unlikely that this was the case because Claude had a collar of submission, exactly the same as the one he was holding in his hands. The guy said that even a king could be commanded with this thing, and even Her Majesty Sylphie herself could be subdued. Mayne knocks down the door on the other side, and the guy flies away with her to the side. The third guy shouts for the mini dragon to burn them, but does not have time to finish. A small wolf cub bumps into the kidnapper and pushes him aside. When the heroes entered the room, all the kidnappers were lying on the floor. Aruto, passing by, noted what a powerful blow the divine beast had, which was to be expected. Sylphie said the baby dragon was fine. A little wolf cub stood next to a baby dragon. He called Mane and told him to take the collar off the baby as soon as possible. Mane told the little dragon to stand still so that he could quickly remove his collar. Mane took off the collar and said that everything was fine now. He told the dragon that they would take him to his mother. Then the baby dragon spread its wings and screamed. Everyone covered their ears from the loud sound. Aruto shouted, asking what it was. Aisha asked why he was shouting. The divine beast told Mane that this was how the dragon decided to call his mother. It's too early to call her yet. Mane thought with horror how dangerous the little dragon's mother was. Mane turned around and shouted for everyone to run out of the tower as fast as possible. The walls began to crumble and the mother of the dragon was making her way through them. Mane shouted Sylphie's name. He was horrified to see her under the rubble of the tower wall. The huge dragon roars at them even more. The little wolf cub quotes that this guy, that is, Mane, stole a child, so the dragon wants to kill him. 
Mena realizes that for the dragon, they are only the people who robbed his family. But this is not the case. Mane screams that it's not him, he can't afford to steal anyone's child. He shouts to Sylphie that he will help her now, let her be careful, he attacks. The dragon does not allow him to see her. Mane begins to realize that he is deliberately interfering. A huge dragon paw flies towards them. Mane tells them not to do this and wounds the dragon. Mane sees Sylphie and realizes that her magic power is disappearing. He runs through the tiles, which are falling one after another. The ground collapses under them, and Aruto catches them. My brother immediately asks if he has any skill that can help Sylphie, who replies that he does. Here an arrow hits the dragon's huge paw. Aisha says she won't hurt anyone else. Aruto tells the others to distract her, and he will help Sylphie. Aruto tells the dragon that he is here. Mane picks up Sylphie and worries about her brother, who says to take care of her, and he will distract the dragon. Mane says he will definitely help. The little wolf is hurrying him. Aisha is worried from behind. Sylphie's strength is running out. The mine is shouted to do it faster. In a moment Sylphie disappears from the hands of the mine to a safe place. The mine apologizes to her mentally. Mane approaches Aruto. He asks if he helped Sylphie, who replies that she is safe and that he has returned her to the castle. Aruto thanks him for his help. Mane says they need to get back as soon as possible. They are worried about them. Aruto says that he will return only with him. Mane says that for now, we need to deal with this dragon. Aruto says that he just needs to return his child. Then a little dragon and a little wolf cub take off and shout to leave him to them. Everyone looks at them in surprise. They arrive at the mother, the little wolf tells her that they have come to help her child. The child is safe, so he asks her to return back to her nest. Aruto asks what he's doing at all. Mane replies that he is persuading the dragon. The little wolf cub turns to others and asks them to say something. The dragon roars even more. Mane shouts that he wants to tear it down. Aruto realizes that his mother wants to destroy this tower. The dragon takes off and destroys the top of the tower. Aruto and Mena fall down. They understand that everything has collapsed. It can fall on people. Suddenly they realize that everything is suspended in the air. Aruto asks Mane what this means. Is it really one of his skills? The little wolf cub screams that this is the eye of attraction. Soon his skill will end its effect. He leaves everything else to others. Aruto wonders if this is a beast skill. Mane says that it is. Anyway, so far everything is going well. He is glad. He uses his skill to carve, many stones pile up and stop working. At this time, inside the tower, the robbers come out to the broken wall and one screams, is it really a dragon? It can't be, did she come to find a cub? The dragon roars that his cry strikes without the action of ordinary people. Mane talks about his destructive scream. Aruto asks if this is really his ability. Mane says that this is not the case. He looks at his characterization and says that this dragon has no abilities. Aruto is surprised. Mane looks surprised. This has not happened before. He doesn't understand what's going on. A fireball appears on the screen, and Mane realizes that everything is bad. A little wolf cub and a little dragon are flying here and shouting that they will help too. The little wolf cub uses a gravitational magic eye. The little wolf cub transmits the words of the little dragon that he also wants to stop his mother and asks for forgiveness for Sylphie. Mane says that he will detain the dragon. He asks Aruto to evacuate the citizens. He says that they are finally here, and all he can do is hope for him. Mane says he's just doing what he can. He leaves and shouts to Aruto's brother that he hopes for him. Aruto stays, the words rushing through his head that Mane is doing what he can. Here Aruto shouts to everyone that he is the first prince of the kingdom, and he has come to save them from the dragon. He says his brother is holding him back now to reduce the number of victims, everyone who lives in this city. The citizens begin to say that this is the truth of his majesty Aruto, he came to help them. Aruto asks them not to panic and help each other to save the city. He appeals to the adventurers and asks them to look for the remaining people in the buildings, those who have medical skills, let them help them, let them do what they can. They all shout and say that this is the way it should be, this is their city, they will do everything possible. They will protect him. They scream. His highness's brother detains the dragon. He's just a boy. What's worse, the dragon is preparing for a new roar. Aruto shouts to Mane to be careful. He shouts that he will not let this happen. He stops right in front of the dragon. The dragon is silent. Mane asks how he does it. He used to insert it on his mouth, but still growls that everything is flying and cracking. Mane immediately uses an iron wall for them. He wonders if she really took off her shoes herself. Mane says she has touched her cub again. The little wolf cub says that she is angry at the helpless people who kidnapped her cub. He says that dragons are like that, they don't recognize those who are weaker than them, but also at him, because he allowed this to happen. She's teaching him a lesson. Mane repeats the words that he recognizes only those who are stronger. 
he decides that he needs to make her think that he is stronger. A little wolf cub with a child and a mine fly up and stop the dragon's blow. People from below are surprised that this boy stopped the dragon strike. How did he end up here in the first place? The dragon growls. Main says if he wants to fight so much, then he will move him to a place where you can do it as much as you want. He says he won't let the city be destroyed anymore. Aruto shouts at Main to stop, because he can't do it alone, let him stop. In an instant, the dragon, along with the animals and the mine, disappear. Aruto screams in horror. People are outraged that the dragon has disappeared. They say as soon as the prince's brother stopped her kick, they disappeared. Someone says that there cannot be someone who is able to hold the dragon. The second assures that this is true. A woman with a little girl, Anna, thanks Aruto for saving her daughter. Aruto says that they are saved thanks to his brother, so she should tell him. The little girl says that they are grateful to him too. She asks if they will meet with him again. Aruto says they will definitely meet. He is thinking and does not understand how it all came to this. They came to save Adora, but the city was destroyed, Sylphie was injured, and he himself did not stop the mine. He wonders where he is, he asks him to come back alive. At this time, in the very cave full of slime, the mine and the dragon are fighting. The dragon and the little wolf cub ask where they are. Main replies that they are in a dungeon under the city. He says that this is an amazing place, it is filled with magical power. Main says that before, when he used his abilities, the destruction was not transmitted to the upper and lower floors. Therefore, you can fight in earnest here, without hiding your abilities from people. The little wolf cub asks if this means he can win. Main says he doesn't know. Main says that, in his opinion, with them he will definitely defeat her. Main thinks about the dragon's tail and that it should hit. He uses two swords and a power up to them. He attacks, but the steel dagger is broken. He begins to realize that he cannot injure her tail. The dragon is preparing to attack again. Main says that you need to avoid the dragon's attacks. The dragon roars with all its might. Main can barely hold on and thinks that he will overcome her with this power. He pushes off the ground and flies straight towards him. He has some kind of invisible weapon in his hand. Main asks how he did it. Finally he was able to cut through his roar. Suddenly, some smoke comes out of the dragon's mouth. Main understands what's what. Fire appears at the dragon's mouth. Main thinks, is it really a fireball? So it appeared. No matter how strong the opponent is, if his ability disappears, he will be confused and will definitely show his weakness. The fire at the dragon's mouth disappears. Main shouts to the kids that now is their way out. The little wolf cub screams at his mother to get a gravitational eye with enhanced magic. The little dragon helps too. Main yells at them to hold her a little longer. Main flies to her, saying that the horn will be confiscated. The little wolf supports him and tells him to go ahead. The dragon looks at him in rage. Then the weapon in Mina's hands disappears. He looks at his empty hand in shock and does not understand why. Main doesn't understand why or what's going on at all. The dragon fires a fireball at them. Main falls in the middle of the fire thinking that both her abilities and skills should have been lost. He keeps falling down. The little wolf cub and the little dragon are floating in the air. Main wonders if the dragon had an invaluable ability. Main falls down and in the process thinks that she didn't have any abilities or skills. Then where did this fire come from? He realizes that his body will burn and he will lose consciousness. He sees a wolf cub in front of him and does not understand where the fire is, why it is here. The baby shouts his name through tears and asks him not to die. He says, doesn't he have a recovery, then let him take it. Main understands absolutely nothing. The kid tells him to take back the recovery he gave him. Main sees that the fire does not reach them. The little wolf explains that the dragon holds back the fire with an iron wall received from him, so let him recover faster. Main is surprised by this information. He sees that the little dragon is standing and uses this ability against his own mother. He begins to reflect that the gravitational eye and the enhancement of magic can only be used after an hour, so their abilities have not disappeared. He holds out his hand. The little wolf cub says joyfully that the smoke from regeneration has gone. The little wolf cub declares that they need to detain the dragon while Main is resting. He's sure she won't lay a finger on him. Main is terrified that this is not possible. They must escape from here. The little wolf tells the dragon to watch the fire. Main tells himself to hold on a little longer. The little dragon gives a sign to the wolf cub, who uses fast running and increasing his strength. His mom always told him that attacking was the best defense. He slams his head against the dragon, which runs out of fire. He rejoices, asking, because it's cool, he stopped the fire. The next second, blood starts flowing from his head. He falls to the ground, and then blood goes all over his body. The little dragon flies to the wolf cub. Main gets up and says that this little wolf cub came to help her child and Sylphie, being injured, was worried about her own cub, 
and she trampled on their good intentions. He clenches his fist and declares that he cannot forgive her. He summons his power, heals the wolf cub and screams why she is so cruel, why she does not even spare her own child. Mane uses the flash of the magic eye, jumps straight at her with a knife. He uses a strong arm, arm strengthening and martial art at the same time. He cuts her horn with the help of the shark's radiance. The dragon screams in horror. The dragon has one eye glowing. Mine lands and realizes that the amplifying abilities have disappeared. Those abilities that were active have been blocked. He understands, that's what's the matter. He says in his head that when an opponent gets lost, his weaknesses manifest themselves. She took advantage of his plan, created fire in the same way. The fire flies towards him. He uses the magic of space and time, redirecting the fire to another dimension. Main says he can't be fooled twice. A portal appears above the dragon, which directs her own fire at herself. She screams in horror. She roars all over the fire, and then only steam comes out of her mouth. She falls powerlessly to the ground. Her skin is emitting steam, as if from a burnt one. Main can barely stand and says that, apparently, that's all. He turns around and sees how the wolf cub is holding the dragon. The first one screams that it was great. He defeated the dragon. The dragon throws the wolf cub to the lane. Main hugs the wolf cub, who is surprised by his reaction. Main says that thank God that he is alive. He replies that it is because he saved him. Main says he was so scared for them. Why did he act so stupidly? Why didn't he run away? The little wolf cub, through sobbing, says in fragments that he did not want him to die. Maybe he did something wrong. Main is crying too and says it's nothing like that. He thanks him several times. The wolf says that if she is cured, she will not attack. Main believes him. They heal her. The little wolf says how cheerful she is. Main wonders if it's because of the dragon's life force. The little wolf cub quotes that she apologizes for Sylphie too. Main says it was their fault initially, since they stole her cub, so let her forgive them too. The little wolf cub says that she forgives and recognizes his strength. Main thanks her. Suddenly they feel someone's presence. Someone is asking what is going on here, why the black dragon is here. He came, feeling the presence of something strange. Main wonders who it is. He turns abruptly, realizing who it is. The stranger says there must be a troll caretaker here. The little wolf cub tells Mainu to be careful. He breathes strong magic. Main asks again. The stranger says what an interesting animal he has. Main is wary. He sees the stranger's long ears, cold eyes. The stranger says he was looking for a caretaker troll, but they're okay too. Main wonders who he is. The stranger says that his person will take away the dragon and this dog from him. This stranger with long ears and a scary aura tells Main to just give him the dragon and the divine dog, and then he will close his eyes to what they were doing in his dungeon. Main sees his gaze and wonders what kind of dungeon he's in, who he even is. The mine immediately uses a full scan but its characteristics are different. The stranger swears at him and asks if he really decided to look at him. Main is horrified that he was able to sense the scan. He wonders if he has this ability too. The stranger laughingly asks what he is afraid of. Does he really want to escape? The little wolf cub quotes the dragon and says that she said that the abilities do not work on him. Main shouts that he will not give up just like that. Four on one, they have an advantage. He realizes to himself that he is too strong. It is dangerous to get involved in a fight with him. The stranger laughs and says that mine even has a trembling voice, besides. After these words, numerous monsters come out, and they stand behind the stranger, waiting for his command. Main is surprised by so many magical creatures. The little wolf cub wonders where they came from. Even he did not feel their presence. The stranger mockingly says that it's a pity that it's not four against one anymore. The stranger tells him to calm down, if it's according to his condition, four on one. Main sees his confidence, so he may well win, it's too dangerous. He tells himself that he has to run, otherwise they will die here. The dragon roars that everyone falls through, losing their balance. He asks if this is the dragon's terror bite ability. Main thinks that the roar is distracting him, so he needs to now, they disappear. The stranger looks around and looks for them. He says that he no longer feels their presence. A complex ability like that of the orc king, a dog or a dragon did it. They were able to escape from him. He believes that this man is very lucky, but soon this world will belong to demons, there will be no place left to escape to. The mother of the cubs says that now everything is clear, they have moved from Adoru to the dungeon. Main says that a strange creature appeared there and very strong, and they escaped from him here. She says that's why they dragged this huge thing into the forest, talking about the dragon. Main apologizes because he couldn't imagine any place other than the forest. She asks how strong the opponent turned out to be that the Maina who knows how to take away abilities, escaped. Main says she is surprised that he could not scan it. 
If he can't see only the ability of a dragon, then he can't even scan his name. She offers him to look at her like that. He asks if it's really possible. She hurries him and asks if he needs someone else's permission. Mind scans and is surprised by her data. She asks him to read aloud all the abilities that he sees. He reads aloud. She asks if there are no others. He replies that only these are strangely shiny and not particularly visible. She says that racial abilities don't seem to be visible. In addition to the roar of the dragon, there is also the terror bite, which causes damage and creates panic. There is also an ability that delays the enemy for one hour with a terrifying roar. Fire blast burning everything. All three of these abilities are racial. She, too, like a divine beast, can use a terrifying roar, but it causes some problems. It's just that such abilities may well even kill someone. The little wolf cub says that they felt it on themselves and almost died. Maine gets scared, the mother asks menacingly. She asks if it's true, he denies it, and the little wolf cub insists that they were almost killed by this dragon, because it's cool. She asks again in a rage, Maine backs away. Even the little dragon is afraid of her anger. Someone says here that she is always short-tempered. She asks if Erm has come to stop her. The voice says that he came to save his brother from death. His mother says that he is, as always, not indifferent. This is the Elder Dragon, the second divine beast. Maine looks at the second divine beast in surprise. He closes his eyes because it's so bright. Maine wonders if it's really his wings that are glowing like that. They turn to him and ask if he hears him. Maine looks up. The second divine beast says that he has established a connection with him so they can talk. He thanks him for stopping her subordinate's rampage. The wolf explains that he is a divine beast standing at the beginning of all dragons. Each divine beast leads its own kind. She descended from the first god and led all the forest beasts. Maine says that's how they are related. The little wolf tells Maine that he and Ermu are also relatives. It's cool after all. The second divine beast says that it is, he is their precious family member. Then the mother reminds him that he was on the verge of death because of someone, asks what they will do about it. Erm replies that he will not say that he understands Fenry. Here the little dragon protects his mother. The little wolf cub says that he protects her with an iron wall that he received from the mine. Fenrir says menacingly, how interesting it is, this child is going against her, let him not regret it. Bane shouts at her to wait, because the dragon is not to blame. Maine screams that it was all people who stole it. Fenrir says that whoever bared his teeth at God will suffer from him. She says that's why her boy will come up with a punishment for them. They look at each other in shock. She says that the time will come when he will replace her, so then let him judge these dragons himself. She turns to the dragons and says that now, the sooner they leave, the better. Her forest is too small for them, nothing can be done about it. The little wolf cub and the little dragon look at each other, then the first one smiles and says that he didn't understand much but he suggests playing again sometime. They all say goodbye. Maine shouts at him not to let people catch him anymore. He responds warmly. Erm sighs wearily and with relief. He turns to his sister and thanks her for forgiving his subordinate. She says with embarrassment that she did it for her boy. Erm turns to Maine and thanks him from the bottom of his heart too. He replies that he couldn't have done it alone. All this is thanks to the people who were with him and believed in him. Erm says that, it turns out, there are good people. He asks if he remembers who caused all this to happen. He says that, however, for merit, he will ask all dragons not to attack humans. Maya thanks him. Erm says that then they can say goodbye. Fenrir asks them to wait, because Maine met a strange guy in the dungeon. He said that the guy looked like a human, but could control monsters. After thinking about it, he replies that it is most likely a demon. Maine is surprised at this conclusion. He says that recently there was a murder of the demon king who adhered to a neutral position, after which a new king was born. He says it looks like he's going to take over their world. Bane begins to wonder if this is the demon king who wants to rule the world. Erm says that, however, there are no obvious signs, except for point clusters of monsters, but it is better to report this to the king of men. Bane replies that he understood him, as soon as he returns, he will tell him everything. Fenrir says it's time for them to return too, she thanks him for looking after her son. Maine says that thanks to him, he helped him a lot. The little wolf asks Maine if he is already leaving. He says with a smile that he is. The little one says that he can come here at any time. He also says that he can come here at any time. He pats him on the head and promises it. They hug for a long time while all his other siblings, including Fenrir, are waiting for him and Maine. Night falls. Maine moves with the help of his ability to some building. He sighs with relief. He says he's finally in Adora. He looks around until someone tells him that he knew he would show up. 
He turns around and sees Aruto standing at the pillar and tells him that he believed that Mina would come. Aruto comes up abruptly and hugs him. Aruto says he was worried about him. He congratulates him on his return and warmly calls him his brother. Aruto notices something and looks at it in surprise. After a while, Du adds that they are returning with Lord Divine Beast. They turn around and see a little wolf cub galloping towards them, wagging its tail and showing all its teeth. Fenrir is standing far away at the same cliff, turning mentally to her boy and asking him to become even stronger so that she does not worry. She tells him to definitely come home. 